Quest presents an unabridged recording of Oath Sword by Griff Hosker, narrated by Marston York. Prologue I am Sven Saxon's sword, and I own one of the mystical and magical dragon swords. Ordered to be made by King Alfred, it was given to the Danish warrior Gudrum when he became a Christian, and I am still unsure why it came into my possession, except that my father, Bersi, was obsessed with the idea of owning a dragon sword. That I took it in a battle in a small Saxon village makes me think that I was meant to own it, and, certainly, it changed my life and that of our clan, the clan of Ayurhon. It made me a warrior of renown, but at the same time it attracted enemies to me like flies around a dunghill. Whenever I fought, and no matter who the enemy was, they always sought me out. Christians sought to kill me, for I owned a sword which was touched by the king they called the Great, and Danes and Norse could not believe that such a callow youth should wield the weapon. It was after I had returned from the last raid on Wessex that I discovered the true story of the sword. The priest who told me did not survive the voyage, and that left nagging doubts in my mind that perhaps his story was untrue. I had wanted Mary, the Saxon whom I had taken back to help my mother Gunhild, to question the priest. Perhaps the Norns, Jorther, Ferdandi, and Skuld had been spinning for my mother lasted barely a week after my return. She had pined for my dead father for years, and despite the care and love lavished upon her by the Christian slave, she slowly went into herself. Her smile when I returned was joyful, but the eyes were sad, and I think she chose to die. The day she died, Egbert, our Saxon thrall, fetched me to the longhouse. Your mother is close to the end, Sven. I could not believe that my mother would leave me. She is not. It is just another chill. Mary will tend to her and she will be well. The Saxon shook his head. You will see. When I entered the chamber in the hall used by my mother, I saw a thin, grey and gaunt figure. Holding her hand was Mary, the Christian maid I had brought as a slave. Gunhild, wife of Bersi and sister to Swain Skulltaker, beamed when I entered, and held out a thin and bony hand for me to take. She put my hand in Mary's, and smiled at us both. Soon I shall see the All-Father, and I am happy knowing that you two are together. What do you mean, mother? You are not dying. I am, and Mary knows it. I looked into Mary's eyes and saw the truth of her words. It was as though the woman who had borne me had developed second sight and could see into the future. You will marry. She placed our hands together and said, It is my wish. She smiled and then her eyes rolled, and after saying, Bercy, softly, she died. It was as though she had hung on to the thread of life until she had given me a command which I could not refuse to obey. Mary made the sign of the cross and folded my mother's hands together. She gave me a sad smile, and I saw a tear trickle from her eye. I knew this day would come. When you were at sea, I saw her weaken each day and knew that she was staying alive just to see you return. This week we enjoyed with her gave me hope that she might have a release from the pain, but she had endured enough of life. Egbert smiled. She has a release now, for she's with your father, Sven. My father is in Valhalla. He shrugged. He was a Christian, and he could know nothing of the ways of the old gods. When she passed, she spoke your father's name. She's with him, for no matter what you believe, I believe that the one God is merciful, and he would wish them to be together. Amen. I looked at Mary, who nodded as she said the word. 
I should have said something then about the marriage, but I did not. I was too upset and confused by the death and the words of the Christians. That I did not was a mistake. I was also afraid. I know that my shield brothers would have been surprised that I should be afraid of anything, but Mary always seemed to hold a power over me, and I was afraid that if I asked her and she rejected me, then I would not be able to face her. My father had been plagued with flaws. I suppose all men are. But my flaw was a fear of rejection, and I said nothing. It was foolish, and looking back, a mistake. But all men have a weakness, and that was mine. The other reason I said nothing was that the day after my mother was buried, the Herseer, her brother Swain Skulltaker, was summoned to King Swain, and all the warriors were too distracted to think of anything except the summons. We knew that King Swain did not hold our clan in high regard, and that, while we had served the King of Denmark each time he had asked, he was a willful king, and he could take it upon himself to punish us in some shape or form. We prepared weapons, and took to attending to the needs of the Drekker. Mary, for her part, had my mother's clothes to distribute to the poor. We did not see much of each other for a few days. The Danish warriors who raided Wessex and Francia were not concerned with gaining land or power, but our kings were. King Olaf Tryggvason was angered by an alliance of Svein Forkbeard, King of Denmark, and Olof Skrytgonen, the King of Sweden. At the time we knew nothing of this, but when Svein Skulltaker was summoned to the court, then we knew that something was afoot. Lodvir had ordered us to make our ships ready for war. He had an idea why the Herseer had been summoned. We were busy repairing our two Drekker. We had raided successfully, and our men were keen to sail across the seas once more and ravage the weakly defended lands of England. Our Drekker were hauled from the water and their hulls scraped. It was not a pleasant duty, but we knew that it was necessary. Lodvir's ship, Hyrokin, was relatively new and did not need much attention, but ours did, for she was old. We had just finished Sea Serpent when my uncle returned from King Swain. That he was not happy was clear, and his face was as black as thunder. He forced a weak smile when he saw that we had cleaned the hulls of the two ships. You are becoming fortune tellers, for we go to war. Lodvir nodded and asked, When? My uncle paused, and, shaking his head, said, we are to muster in the Osterzoon. There is an island in the channel there. We call it Anholt, but the Norse call it Svolder. The Swedes are bringing their ships, and King Olaf Tryggvason comes to do battle with us. Griotard used a splinter of wood to remove a tough piece of gristle from his teeth. King Olaf has the largest ship afloat. Long Serpent will not be easy to defeat. You are right, my friend. But there is treachery, for King Swain had suborned some of the Norse Jarls, and when the Norwegians sail it will be with just a handful of ships. Our brave king leaves nothing to chance. Swain shrugged. We follow the other ships, and we will do our duty, but my heart is not in this. My foster father was an honourable man. I had yet to fight in a sea battle, certainly one of this size. I spoke quietly, thinking that only Lodvir heard me, but the sudden silence meant that all heard my words. But if we outnumber them by so many, then where is the danger? We fought the Saxons at sea and did not lose a single ship. Griotard laughed. The Saxons? They are not seamen. They are poor warriors whom we can defeat easily on land. At sea they are even worse. No, Sven, we face the Norse, and you would be a fool to underestimate them. In a battle such as this, then you either win and sail your ship home or sink beneath the waves. Even if we outnumber them by ten to one, and that I doubt, they will fight hard, and we could win our own battle and still die. 
That evening, as I returned to the home I now shared with Mary and Egbert, I was, I confess, fearful. I had every confidence in my ability with Oathsword, and I knew that I could fight well. But a drecker tossing on the sea was a different matter. After Griotard had given me his stark assessment of a sea battle, I had spoken with him as we hauled the drecker back to the sea. Then it might be better to fight without mail. There would be less chance of drowning, that is true, but it means you would be more likely to die from a wound. When a sea battle is over, then the survivors of the losing side flee. They have no time to look for survivors, and the winning side only rescue their own. You make it sound hopeless. He gave me a sad smile. Sven, you are a good warrior, and I've seen you fight. Your Saxon sword and your dancing feet make you an opponent to be feared, but the tossing deck of a drecker is not the place for dancing feet. A lumbering Norse who spreads his legs and swings his sword in an arc is just as likely to kill you by accident when you slip as he is to make a skilled side with a well-timed blow. A battle on a drecker is always about luck. When I reached the hall I was preoccupied, and after Egbert had fetched me a horn of ale I sat before the fire. We kept a fire going even on a summer's day. I heard movements in the room which was hidden behind the wall hangings. It had been my mother's room and she had been given privacy on the orders of Mary. She had been quite clear about what my mother had needed. What is that noise, Egbert? He looked embarrassed and shifted his weight onto his good leg. Lord, it is Mary. She's sorting out your mother's chamber. Sorting it out? He shook his head. Better that you ask her, for she does not take kindly to my questions. I sighed and emptied the horn. I needed the drink, but I would not be able to enjoy it. What was she doing? The room needed no sorting out. I moved along the wall hanging. She had been making so much noise that I doubted she had heard our words. I saw that she was trying to move the bed. What are you doing? She had an angry look on her face, but I think that was because I had found her out. I wish to move the bed, is all. Perhaps my mind was still filled with the prospect of a sea battle, for I said, Why? Mother is dead. And you are going to let the best bed in the house remain unoccupied? The anger left her face and her voice. I thought to move in, but the bed must face east to west. Her actions now became clear, but I wondered why she had not asked me to help. And then I realised she had thought I might say no. Nodding, I said, It will be easier if we all help. Egbert, the thrall appeared. We need to move the bed to face east to west. You are not angry? I smiled. No, Mary, for you are right in one respect. The bed needs to be used. Come, with three of us we can move the bed and then I can enjoy my second horn of ale in peace. I was right, and it did not take long. When we ate our evening meal which the kitchen thralls had prepared, I told Egbert and Mary of the prospect of war. Surprisingly, Mary did not seem that upset. The Norse are an evil people. They took the precious books from Lindisfarne and destroyed them. Why? Because they did not understand them. We take holy books too, Mary. I saw Egbert shake his head. Mary gave a smile. You are practical men and sell them. They end up with Christians, and while I cannot condone the attacks, the result is not as bad as an attack by the Norse. The woman with whom I shared my house was complicated, and I did not understand her at all. She always gave me the impression that she knew more than I did, and men do not like that. The truth was, she was the cleverest woman I had ever met, and that made me a little afraid. We were to leave three days later for the sail to join the other ships close to the Isle of Svolder. I was kept busy with the Drekker, but it did not bother Mary for she was busy making the room her own. She had Egbert to move a chair into the room for her. She had sat on a stool when she had tended to my mother, but she now wished a chair. She also had a small altar with a cross made by one of the thralls. 
She had a cross, but I knew from comments she made that she wished for a better one, and I also knew that it had to be paid for and not stolen. I still sailed on my foster father's drecker, but now it felt familiar, almost like home. Lodvius was a newer ship, but Sea Serpent was comforting, like an old pair of boots which were well worn in. We did not know how long we would be at sea, and we loaded supplies, for we did not know exactly when the King of Norway would come to do battle. King Swain would be most unhappy if any of his ships had to return to port because they had no food left. We were able to load our chests earlier than we might, for we knew what was expected of us. I had my birney, sealskin cape, fur, and dried food prepared by Egbert. I left the fine new Saxon sword in the hall. Oath sword would be sufficient. I fastened Saxon slayer my spear to the thwarts. The night before we left, Swain Skulltaker held a feast in the mead hall we had built after we came back from our last victory. We wanted somewhere we could celebrate. It was a measure of the ambition Swain Skulltaker had. My father had been more of a dreamer, and such a hall would have remained in his head. This would be the first time we would sit and feast. Swain One Eye, now more comfortable with his one eye, gave us a song. The birth of his son and the love of his wife, Berliot, had helped him to recover his confidence. Swain Skulltaker was a great lord, sailing from Ayrhorn with his sons aboard. Sea serpents sailed and ruled the waves, taking Franks and Saxons slaves. When King Swain took him west, he had with him the men that were best. Griotad the Grim, Lodvir the Long, made the crew whole and strong. From Francia, where the clan took gold, to Wessex, where they were strong and bold. The clan obeyed the wishes of the king, but it was of Skulltaker that they sing. With the dragon sword to fight for the clan, all sailed to war, every man. The cunning king who faced our blades showed us he was not afraid. Trapped by the sea and by walls of stone, Swain Skulltaker fought as if alone. The clan prevailed, Skulltaker hit, saved by the sword which slashed and slit. From Francia, where the clan took gold, to Wessex, where they were strong and bold, the clan obeyed the wishes of the king, but it was of Skulltaker that they sing. And when they returned to Ayron, the clan was stronger through the wounds they had borne. With higher walls and home much stronger, they are ready to fight for Swain Skulltaker. From Francia, where the clan took gold, to Wessex, where they were strong and bold, the clan obeyed the wishes of the king, but it was of Skulltaker that they sing. When Swain One Eye had finished the song, then the table was banged with the hilts of daggers as men chanted the name of the Hersier. Of course, I had heard fragments when Swain had told them to Alf, my other cousin, and me. We had spent a long time trying to find a rhyme for stake-filled ditch, but we could not. I had persuaded my cousin to make my part smaller. I had not wished to be named, for I did not think I was important enough. It was well received. We all knew that it was not exactly the way it happened, but as with all battles, it was the way men would remember it when it was retold in the future. The Herseer stood and thanked his sons. I am honoured that my son, a great warrior and a scald, should compose such words. I am humbled. Know this, Swain, one eye. The next battle may be even more bloody. I just hope that there will be warriors left to compose it. The euphoria of the moment evaporated, and I wondered at the wisdom of the Hersier. My father would have reveled at the moment. They were different leaders, that was for sure. Griotard the Grim had, despite his name, a wicked sense of humour and a total disregard for kings and princes. He lightened the moment and made men smile. Now, think on this, Swain One Eye. Do not make the mistake of singing that song when King Swain is near, for he would want all of the glory and be most unhappy that he barely has a mention. He paused and swallowed a large mouthful of beer. Of course, no matter how far he shall be from King Olaf's ship in this coming battle, I can guarantee that he will be the one accorded the glory of the victory. Lodvir grinned and rolled his eyes while Swain Skulltaker just looked to the table. 
That night, when I returned to the hall, a little drunk, I confess, Egbert was waiting for me. I heard the singing, Lord. It was a good night. Since I had returned from our last victory, the thrall had called me Lord rather than Master. I think it was because he now knew the true story of the sword. The term flattered me, for I was not a Lord. I was Bondi, as were the others. The only title I had earned was Hearthweru. I guarded Swain Skulltaker. Nodding, I laughed unsteadily towards my bed. I was never a great drinker and usually stopped earlier than most men, but the praise my cousin had received had made me foolish. Aye, Egbert, and tomorrow I leave. Has Mary retired? She's on her knees saying her prayers. I laughed. Her God seems to like his subjects in that position. He seems to be like Swain Forkbeard. Egbert just made the sign of the cross with his free hand. He said nothing as he led me to the bed to undress me. He had little to take off, my boots, breeks and kirtle. He laid me on the bed and went to fetch the bearskin, but I waved him away. It is hot. Aye, Lord. Good night. I almost passed out immediately, but I had enough wit to turn on my side. I dreamt a strange dream, but it was about Mary and not the coming battle. I dreamed that I held her and kissed her, but the moment my lips almost touched her, she became a dragon and devoured me. Then I felt the ale rising in my gut and it brought me awake. I put my head to the side and vomited. I retched until my stomach hurt. I had eaten well and it took some time for my stomach to empty. The action partially sobered me up and I thought to rise, rinse my mouth and then clean the floor for I was embarrassed by my action. When I opened my mouth and looked down I saw that there was no mess. But Mary's hands held a pail and she had stopped the vomit from reaching the floor. I was mortified for I was naked. I grabbed for the bearskin. She laughed. Sven, it is a little late for that. How? I heard your words when you came in, and your mother had told me how your father, when he drank too much, would oft be sick. She said she always had a pail to hand. I was just prepared. She shrugged. You were lucky that I was still here when you began. She poured a horn of water and handed it to me. Here, drink this. All of it mind. My unsteady hand touched hers, and it had an effect. My nakedness became even more embarrassing. She glanced down and laughed. Now, I think, is not the moment. She stood and I drank. It took the sour taste from my mouth and I swore I would never drink so much ale again. When I had finished, I handed the horn back to her, and this time she ensured that our hands did not touch. I am sorry for this, but I thank you. She smiled. Sven, I have seen the best of you, and I have seen the worst of you. I can live with both. If you are sick again, make sure you strike the pail. You can empty it in the morning. I have done my part. She left me and I found myself smiling. She did not hate me. My mother's command came back to me. I had thought Mary had forgotten it. But she had not. Chapter 1 Östersund 1000 We had a long way to sail, for we had a home on the west coastline of Denmark, and we had to sail to the sea close to the east coast, the Östersund. It would take many days. We would first sail to the port belonging to the Jarl of Ribbe, where Jarl Harald would join us with his ships, and slowly we would progress around the coast, picking up more ships as we went. We would not be the largest contingent in the fleet, but we would be a sizable one. There would be eighteen ships under the command of the Jarl. Ribbe was the place that stretched along the coast. 
there were four or five places where ships could land. The largest was called Rubbe in honour of the Jarl, while ours was simply named after the clan. As some of the clan lived on the islands that protected us from the worst the sea had to throw at us, they too were referred to as Eyrhann. But for us, Eyrhann was the Herseer's Hall, and the wooden quay and jetty jutting into the sea. That first day of rowing almost killed me. I had not eaten breakfast as I could not face food, and I felt nauseous all the way north. Swain and Alf were also suffering, and so the mocking came from the older warriors. They had endured a similar rite of passage, but that did not stop them from mocking us. None of us was in any shape to argue. Perhaps the rowing helped to cleanse my body. I sweated as though it was high summer in Africa, and it seemed to tell me that it was the sweat that had purged me. We rowed in silence, and that helped me to reflect upon Mary and our situation. I knew that I had put off for too long that which I should have done when my mother was alive. I regretted my indecision. No matter what happened during the next weeks and the coming battle, I would ask Mary to be my wife. I could even take the rejection, and if she did, then I would give her her freedom and have her taken back to her home. A drunken night, vomit, and a hard row will do that to a man. The combination strips away all that is unnecessary and leaves him with answers, however unpalatable. There were too many other crews in the harbour for us to be accommodated, and so we slept on the drecker. We did at least eat. The Jarl sent cauldrons of food and bread for us. I ate, but sparingly. The tiredness and the previous night combined to make me fall asleep on my bearskin. I was awoken before dawn with a sea fret that felt as wet as rain. I cursed my lack of foresight. The wiser, older warriors had all covered themselves with their sealskin capes and their furs would be dry. We younger warriors would have to try to dry them on a drecker with spray flying over the bows. We resigned ourselves to the prospect of a cold and damp bed. When we reached the northern tip of Denmark, our voyage changed. We were entering the Östersund. We had been told that King Olaf had not set sail yet, but who knew if that was some sort of trick? It was with some relief that we turned to the northeast tip of Denmark and Jutland to head south to the muster. Jarl Harald used the voyage south to practice the tactics and formations we would use. His ship would be the tip of the arrow, but we were honoured by being chosen as the second ship from his steerboard side, with Lodvia to our steerboard. It was a measure of the success we had enjoyed. King Swain might not give us the credit we felt we were due, but the other men of the Reba fleet did, and I felt proud of the men of Ayerholm. The exercises and the manoeuvres meant that we arrived at the island of Svolder half a day late. That was not bad after our journey, but it meant we had less of a choice over our moorings. The island had been chosen because it was large enough to accommodate all the ships which would arrive. Triangular in shape, the best berths were those where there was shelter from the prevailing winds. Thorstein the Lucky was careful as he had edged us, stern first, into the beach. He had two of his ship's boys swim ashore and they guided us backwards. When they held up their hands, then Thorstein had us back water and ropes were thrown to secure us to the land. Our blacksmith had made two huge sharpened spikes from weapons that had been killed or damaged so much as to render them useless. They were driven into the sand. Each was as long as a ship's boy. I knew that they would take some shifting. At the same time, as we stacked our oars on the mast fish, other boys dropped heavy anchors from the bows. We would be as secure as it was possible on such a sandy island. We were on the long side of the island, the side which faced the Norwegian sea only held twenty ships. When we passed there had only been ten, and they were King Swain's. We were told that the other ten were for the King of Sweden. While the Jarl, Swain's skull-taker, 
Lodvir and the other captains went to speak with Carl Three Fingers, we set about building a camp. That the Swedes were not yet here meant that battle was not imminent, and both Griotard and Thorstein wanted us to be as comfortable as it was possible. As the hearthweru of the Hersir, we had to make his bed first, and when we had done so we collected as much deadwood and undergrowth as there was to be found. There was little to be had, but we used what there was for the Hersir. The ones who came later would find nothing. We then fashioned our capes on the wood so that there was a roof over our four beds. By using piled-up sand where the beds faced the sea and around the sides, we ensured that we would be as comfortable as it was possible to be for however long we had to wait for the Norwegian king. The captains had not returned by the time we had foraged the shoreline and hauled in the catch from the lines hanging from the Drekker's sides. We knew that this bounty would diminish, for we would soon exhaust what there was, but we enjoyed it all the more for that. We also searched for seafood, and that too was, when we searched, plentiful. In my case, it was the first real meal I had enjoyed since I had emptied the contents of my stomach in my hall. The fires we had lit kept away the flies, and it was a pleasant evening. There was no sunset over the sea on this coast, but we all anticipated a spectacular sunrise. I had taken out my whetstone when we had finished eating, and I was sharpening my seax, long dagger, Saxon slayer, and, of course, oath sword. The long dagger was new. I had used some of my treasure to have the weaponsmith make me a knife to my own specifications. It had a strong hilt and a blade that tapered. I had a seax for close-in work, but I wanted a weapon that was like a short sword but lighter. I had yet to use it and therefore to name it. I was happy with the work of the weaponsmith. Knowing of oath sword, he had incorporated a dragon on the handle. My weapons had all been kept from the worst that the sea could throw at us with sheepskin, but it did no harm to clean, sharpen, and then oil them with seal oil. There was something soothing about sharpening a blade. The slow, regular motion made for a sharp edge while the action emptied the mind and let it drift. I had just finished and put away the stone and weapons when the captains returned. Lodvir had been summoned too. He might command a small ship, but he was still a captain. Alf ladled out Swain's food while Axel Moltison served Lodvir, and we let them eat before we pestered them with questions. Swain spoke. It seems there is a treacherous conspiracy going on. The two kings have already promised many of the Norse Jarls lands and position when they partition Norway. It means that the Norwegian king will have fewer ships than we might have expected. Lars Larsson asked, How many would you define as fewer? Some think he might have as few as twenty, while others say we should expect forty. His brother, Leif, said, Then, with as few as that, we need no more ships. We could take them just with our ships. And that is the plan. We wait here, almost hidden until they pass us, and then we launch our ships to attack them when they try to return through this sea. We will be as a net catching a shoal of fish. It seemed a good plan. Alf, the youngest of us, was left to ask an obvious question. If he has so few ships, then will he fight? Might he not simply stay at home? That is a possibility. But if he did so, he would lose his kingdom, for those Jarls who have switched allegiance would also fight him. No, he will come. For, with the largest Drekker ever built, some say it is unsinkable, he believes that he and his mighty warriors can defeat us. Great warriors? I was intrigued, for I only knew the name of the king. Einar Thambraskelther is supposedly the greatest Norse archer, and there are others. Thorsten Oxford, Kettle the Tall, and Bercy the Strong, to name but a few. How do we know all of this when we are here, and the Norse are many leagues to the north? 
Lars asked a good question, and it showed the sharpness of his mind. Lodvir had finished his ale, and he spoke. We have a Norse traitor with us, Jarl Svin Hakonason, the Earl of Ladde. He has deserted the Norse king's court. He knows all, and he has been promised much by King Swain. It was he who estimated the lower number of ships. I do not like the fact that he is a traitor, but he seems to know his business. And so we waited. The king of Sweden arrived, and we saw that when the whole fleet was gathered we had one hundred and ten ships. The Norse would be defeated. Even the upper number of forty would not help them. That was not as comforting a thought as I had expected. Any warriors killed in such a battle would have wasted lives. I found myself looking at my oar brothers and wondering which of us might not survive. As we had predicted, the catches grew less, and the stews we ate became more salted meat and fish than fresh fish. But we did not mind. We had even built a bread oven, and we ate bread. It was not as good as that which we might enjoy at home, but the smell of it cooking acted as food before we had even eaten it. Then those on the far side of the island saw the ships of the Norse. They passed early in the morning when we were hidden by fog, but their masts could be seen. A drekker has a higher mast than a nar or a trading vessel. The kings were caught napping, for our ships were not manned and ready. By the time the sun had risen, the Norwegian fleet were just dots on the horizon. We were ordered to launch our ships while the captains were summoned to the two kings and the Norwegian earl. Swain Skulltaker shook his head as he returned and boarded the Drekker. Eleven ships we fight. Eleven. This will not be a fight, but a massacre. Where is the Norse king gone? To the Wends in Pomerania, Greatard. He seeks allies from the Wends, and he hopes to have ships and men from them. Then there will be more than eleven ships. Not many more, for Jarl Sigvaldi, the leader of the Joms Vikings, and his men have been paid to keep the Wends at home. Our king does not battle for a crown, he buys one. Now I see that all the raids to England were for one purpose— not to conquer that country, but to buy another. I turned to Swain one eye. Who are the Yom's Vikings? The Hairseer answered grimly, A band of fanatical warriors who refuse to follow any king. They have a stronghold at Yomsburg, which is so hard to take that the kings tolerate them. They raid where they will, and serve any master, so long as they are paid well. And so we waited at sea. The kings chose the straits at Orisunt. The sea is but a couple of miles from coast to coast there. We could almost make a long port with the ships we had. I knew from Lodvir that a long port was a sort of floating port. Ships would be tied together, and unless the weather was stormy would give a stable platform. It was used, Lodvir said, when there were too many ships to anchor in a port. I realised then that it could be used as a quickly erected bridge. The battle plan was a simple one, and had been devised by Carl Three Fingers. As such, it was clever and effective. However, King Swain had modified it, and it was to ensure glory for him. Whilst taking away none of its simplicity, he had given himself the best opportunity of both glory and victory. It also kept him relatively safe. In the original plan, the two kings would have sailed to flank Long Serpent. Jarl Svein Hakonason, with the ships defected from Norway, would be our reserve line, and our contingent, the men of Ripa, would sail around the end of the enemy line to cut off a retreat and attack the steerboard of Long Serpent. We had been honoured to have been chosen for such a role, but, within an hour of the decision being passed to us, an embarrassed Carl Three Fingers told us that King Swain would attack the rear, and we would join the line attacking the centre. Our silence made it even worse for Carl when he told us. He almost shuffled back to his king. We would have the harder task, and none of us was bothered about the glory. 
We had all rowed in mail, and that had been hard enough. But now we had to wait in our mail, and it was a sunny day. We took down our mast, as did all the other ships. Only Jarl Sven Hakunason, on his ship Iron Ram, and the reserves, as well as King Swain's handful of Drekker, kept their masts, for they had to be manoeuvrable. We could not see King Swain, who waited to the south, ready to take the prevailing wind and fall upon the rear of the enemy. We would rely instead upon the power and speed of the oars, and the skill of Thorst and the Lucky. It was one of the ship's boys, Guthrum, who spotted the enemy before any of the other ships. It was a remarkable achievement, for we were not the closest, and he had no mast upon which to squat. Instead, he was precariously perched upon the prow of our ship. Enemy fleet in sight! He pointed to the south, and we were facing in that direction. The word was passed to the Drekker closest to us, and the words rippled out to the rest of the fleet. The southernmost ship would signal King Swain, and the rearmost ships then signal Jarl Sven Harkonnesen. The order was then given to row. Speed was not essential at first, for the enemy would not yet see us. We had no masts. It was when they came to within half a mile that we would speed up to allow us to smash into them. Then there would be a terrible collision of shattered wood and oars. Some ships would sink, and those men with mail would sink beneath the waves. We did have some snecker, just eight, and their task was to pick up survivors. The odds, however, were against survival if we were holed. The Hercio shouted, How many do we face, Gudrum? Balanced on the prow and with a hand shading his eyes from the morning sun, he paused and said incredulously, Eleven? There was another pause and then he said, They are stopped in taking down the sails. Griotard said, The old fool intends to fight. Oh, father, but he is a true Viking. He makes a long port. Swain Skulltaker cupped his hands and shouted across to Jarl Harald Longstride on Stormbird. Long port. The words drifted back. Aye, the Swedish king wishes ramming speed. May the old father be with you. It made a sort of sense. It would take time for the Norse to unstep their masts and then bind all their ships together. If we could hit them while they were doing so, then there would be confusion and possibly victory. It was, however, a risk, and one I knew that the Jarl, Svein, and Lodvir would not have taken. Now we chanted, and it was Swain one eye who was given the order to do so by his father. We used Bluetooth. Bluetooth was a warrior strong. He used a spear, stout and strong. Fighting Franks and slaying Norse, he steered the ship on a deadly course. Njarda, Njarda, push the dragon. Njarda, Njarda, push the dragon. The spear was sharp, and the Norse did die. Through the air did Valkyries fly. A day of death and a day of blood, the warriors died as warriors should. Near the, near the, push the dragon. Near the, near the, push the dragon. When home they came with Bernie's red, they toasted well our Danish dead. They sang their songs of warriors slain, and in that song they lived again. Near the, near the, push the dragon. Near the, near the, push the dragon. We flew. Lodvia next to us used the same chant, and they kept pace with us. We were making no attempt to overtake our Jarl, but the crew of the Threatanessa fire dragon, captained by one of the Jarl's sons, must have had a rush of blood, for it began to edge ahead, not only of the Jarl, but also of King Olaf of Sweden. We could see nothing of this, but Guthrum gave us commentary as he kept us informed about the Norse fleet. It was when he shouted, They are all secured, that we knew that Olaf Tryggvason had well-trained men. That was followed by, Fire Dragon is going to strike! We had to forget our comrades, for Thorsten's voice took over. Prepare to withdraw oars! The last thing we needed was shattered oars which could splinter and blind or maim a man. We knew that we would be close to striking. There was a mighty crash ahead of us and the sound of screams and cries. Even as Thorstein gave the command to withdraw oars, we heard the voice of Guthrum telling us that Fire Dragon had sunk. The Jarl had lost a son. A moment of madness, an almost berserk act, had taken the men of a whole village beneath the sea. It was a waste. 
We heard all this as we calmly stacked our oars. As soon as we had done so, we each took our shield from the gunwale, donned our helmets, and took our weapon of choice. Mine was obvious. Oath sword. Saxon Slayer would be too unwieldy to use aboard a dracker as there would be too many men packed closely together. I joined Swain One-Eye and Alf and followed Swain Skulltaker down the centre of the dracker to the prow. It was then I saw the wall of wood we faced, and to our left I saw the enormous beer moth that was Long Serpent. Its prow stuck out half the length of a Threatonessa from the rest of the Norse fleet. Even as men made our way forward, I saw Jarl Harald and his men attempting to board her. But before them stood the mightiest mailed warriors I had ever seen. Then I had to concentrate on our job, for arrows were sent towards us, and our job was to protect the Hersir. Swain and I lifted our shields to cover his father's head. The ship's boys, with no protection whatsoever, were trying to put in place the planks to help us cross to the Norse longport. Our archers were duelling with the Norse. I saw Lars Sigison plunge over the side pierced by an arrow. It made Swain Skulltaker move even more quickly, and we hurried after him, careful not to slip. I felt Griotard's shield in my back and was comforted, for I knew he would urge the rest of the crew to follow closely. This was a mighty battle. Already I could hear the crack and creak as ships struck, and the cries of the dying. But our own battle was a small one. It was the Hersir and his Hearthweru. We would fight our own small battle and hope we won. It was when Swain Skulltaker stepped up to the plank that he was most vulnerable. He was a skilled warrior, and the Norse warrior who ran at him swinging a boarding pike was not. He was just reckless. Showing great balance for a man of his age, the Hersir simply swung to his right and the boarding pike slid along his mail. Swain one eye smacked the edge of his sword against the head of the pike, and that simple action caused the man to overbalance and plunge, fully mailed, into the sea. The Hersir did not wait, but shouting, Ayaron, ran along the plank to board the Norse trekker. The cry of the clan was inspiring. Their warriors were waiting for us. These were not reckless like the one whose body was now tumbling towards the bottom of the shallow sea, but they were determined, and a wall of shields and mail bristling with spears and swords awaited us. Swain Skulltaker halted and shouted, Wedge! Swain One Eye and I were already in place, and Alf slipped behind us with Griotard behind me. Dreng was the other to flank Alf, and the six of us were enough to move forward. Griotard began the chant to help us keep step and to give heart to the clan. For some of the younger warriors this was their first battle, and I still remembered the first time I had chanted my way to battle. The chants helped. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend. Our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend. Our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. Swain Skulltaker headed for the tall warrior with the long spear who stood in the centre of their line. He had filed teeth and a tattooed face. His shield bore a red skull on a white background and at his waist hung a good sword. Swain Skulltaker knew his business, and with my shield pressing in his back and his sons protecting his left side, he stepped forward with his sword held high. I knew my business, too, for we were not fighting a wedge but a line, and that line was backed by ever-widening lines of warriors. There was a warrior to Swain Skulltaker's right, and I would need to deal with him. He was a squat warrior, and he held a sword which was held to strike a backhanded slash down my foster father's right side as he sought to kill the mighty spearman. I had no shield to use, for that was in Swain Skulltaker's back, and as soon as I stepped forward to strike, then there was another Norse who would have a free blow to my right. I was Hearthweru, and this was my job. I had to risk my life to save the Hersir. 
It was as the swordsman slashed and I lunged that I felt rather than saw the coiled rope thrown by Griotard. I had been aware of it as I had passed it close to the prow of the Norse vessel, but I was young and did not see it as a weapon. Griotard was a veteran and he used anything to hand. The rope hit the swordsman and his strike missed. I was young and had quick hands and Oath's sword was longer than the Norse blade and I caught the warrior beneath the chin. The sword entered his head, ripping through his throat and skull, and his blow was not struck. Griotard's shield and sword appeared next to me, followed by his body. He roared, Ayerhan! and he swung his sword at the Norseman who filled the gap vacated by the man I had slain. To my left, the Herseer was winning his battle with the mighty warrior who was now hampered by his weapon. Swain's skulltaker had whittled chunks from the shaft of the sphere, and it would not be long before it broke. From a few rows back, I heard Lars as he shouted, Push! I felt the weight of the clan as those who had boarded the Norse Drekker now leaned against their shields. If we were to get more men aboard, we needed to shift the ones from before us. The deaths we had caused meant we had gained the length of a spear, but now we were shield to shield. Another Norseman with filed and blackened teeth pulled back his head to butt me. It was not a new experience for me, but I was helped by the pressure from behind. As I stepped forward and he butted, I lowered my head so that the nasal of the Norseman would strike the crown of my helmet. There was a ridge of strengthening metal there and would be able to resist the blow. The man had concentrated so much on the butt that he failed to move his feet and as his head came down, he found himself moving backwards, for we were pushing hard. His head still connected, but it was a weak blow, and I pushed hard with my head. His feet left to the ground, and his weight of mail made him start to fall. He naturally spread his arms for balance, and I had enough space to stab with oath sword. I even had the luxury of aiming for a broken link, and I thrust hard to enlarge the break and tear into his flesh. His falling had already forced the ones behind to move backwards, and Swain Skulltaker slew his man, as did Griotard. We gained another spear's length, and more men from our clan stepped forward. We were almost at the mastfish. It was then I heard Alf's voice. We had practised many moves at Ayrhan, and when he shouted, Leaf! Lars! Shield! I knew what he intended. It was a most dangerous thing to do, and I knew that his father would not be happy. But I also knew why he did it. He was the only one not using his weapon, for he was behind Swain and me. With the space we had created, Leif and Lars held a shield between them. Alf ran at the shield, and as he stepped on it, they threw him in the air. He cleared his father and the first rank of the Norse. He managed to aim his feet so that his weight struck two men, while his sword drove into the neck of a third. The sword, which was thrust almost blindly at him, merely scraped along his mail. The effect was devastating. Not only were many of the Norse so shocked and surprised by the act that they stopped fighting, but also it cleared a space in the second and third ranks. Swain One Eye and his father both slew two surprised Norsemen, and I brought my sword down to smash into the helmet of another. He fell to the ground, and Griotard swung his sword in a wide scythe, slicing through the noses and faces of two men. Suddenly, the Norse before us were shattered, and having reached at the widest part of the Drekker, the clan who had just boarded with freshly sharpened weapons flooded around the flanks of the demoralized Norwegians. I could not believe the speed with which we dispatched the rest. Although most we now faced had no mail, they had not yet been in combat, but each blow struck by one of the clan brought a wound or death. It was as we neared the steering board that I realised that Jarl Svein Hakonason had attacked the left flank of the longport and had already taken one ship. He had disobeyed his orders, but in doing so had given us an advantage. We were winning! As we slew the last of the Norse crew, Swain Skulltaker turned. Ay, Your Honour, we're made for a long serpent. Alf the swooping hawk has shown us that we are the hunters. Let our swords feast on Norse flesh. I knew that Alf would be happy, for he now had a name. 
we had the advantage now of attacking the next Drekker, two down from Long Serpent from the side, and as the crew of Stormbird were fighting on one front, we had the chance to outnumber them. When they saw us haul ourselves onto the gunnels, a voice cried, Face larboard! The Deans have come! Even as I stood and prepared to follow our Herseer into the heart of the ship, I saw Jarl Harald Longstride fall. His hearthwearer had fallen already, and three men fell on him. They hacked and chopped long after he was dead. With the best men of Ribbe dead, the rest began to fall back, and the Norse surged to throw them back aboard Stormbird. We owed more to our Jarl and the men of Ribbe than a self-serving king, and Swain saw the danger. He leapt down and began a furious attack on the back and sides of the Norse. His sons and I were with him instantly, and the four of us locked shields to hack, chop, and slash into the backs of the Norse crew. Behind us I heard Griotard shout, Protect the hair, seer! It gave the four of us the confidence to push on as we had support. We could now see that ships had been sunk. The long port meant that the Norse could drop huge rocks from the higher sides of Long Serpent, and ships had been holed. Others had been damaged by the ramming speed they had employed. The result was that despite our successes the Norse were still a force to be reckoned with, as they had yet to lose a ship. I had not seen King Swain and his men appear in the surprise attack on the rear. When we reached the butchered, mutilated bodies of Jarl Harald and his Hathweru, Swain Skulltaker roared, Men of Reba, we guard the body of our Jarl. Come and take revenge on these barbarians. With a roar, the deflated warriors who had returned to their sinking ship renewed their attack with such vigour and ferocity that the Norwegians, overextended as they were, began to fall back. The ones at the rear turned and faced the four of us. The ones we would fight had no mail, and we did. More than that, our weapons were the best, and when I blocked the blow from one warrior, well struck though it was, it simply bent on mine. I punched him in the face with the boss of my shield, and as he reeled, skewered him. The ones whom we fought lasted just enough time for Griotard to corner the captain and his oath sworn at the steering board. As we made our way back, I slipped my shield over my back. The arrows had long ceased to be used, and in any case their best arrows had already been sent. The ones they had left would not penetrate my burney. Instead, I drew my long dagger which was almost like a short sword. The fighting would be even closer from now on, and I wanted more offensive options. When we reached the steering board, I saw that we had lost men. That was no surprise, for these men were the best that this crew had to offer. There were eight Norse men left, and all were bloodied. Some bore wounds, and one had a left arm which he would never be able to use. Griotard, Leif, and Lars moved aside when we reached them. Swain Skulltaker said, The rest of you, finish off any wounded, tend to our men, and then prepare to take the next ship. The eight of us are enough to send these eight men to Valhalla. The captain, I could see that he too was a hersier, laughed. You are that confident, Dean. My foster father nodded. One man is so badly wounded that he will last but a moment, and then we will outnumber you. Your men butchered our yarl, and so we are honour bound for vengeance. I am Swain Skulltaker of Ayrhan, and if you have not heard of me, your widow will. And finally, he nodded to me, my hearth where who has a dragon sword once wielded by King Guthrum. He smiled. Yes, I am confident. At them. It was a brilliant strategy, for his voice was even throughout, and it was as though he had lulled them with a spell. The reference to the dragon sword made every eye go to me so that when our eight swords struck, the one-armed man and a young Hearthweru died without even raising their swords. We now outnumbered them by two warriors, and when the man facing me put all his energy into a blow to smash the dragon sword from my hand— he did not notice the dagger stabbing up from beneath his burney to gut him. 
Griotard attacked his man so ferociously that the warrior tripped over a rope and tumbled over the gunwale into the sea. Griotard was so angry that he had not slain his opponent that he slashed his sword into the spine of the captain of the Drekker, the Hersir. It showed the anger in our oldest warrior, but he knew he had done wrong. I am sorry, Swain Skulltaker, but the blood was in my head and I could not see straight. The rest of the Norse Hearthweru lay dead. Swain nodded. This will be a day like no other old friend. The Norns have spun. It was weird. The ship was ours, and we saw Lodvir lead his men from the first ship we had taken. Like Griotard, the bloodlust was upon him. He shouted, his face covered in blood. It is our turn to be the first, Herr Seer, for I do not wish Griotard to gain all the glory. With me! Some of the men we had led followed him. Swain said, This fight is not over. It is not a land battle where men can flee. They fight and win or fail and die. He pointed with his sword to the southwest. See, our brave king brings reinforcements. The sarcasm in his voice was clear. Alf, that was a brave thing you did, but no more. Be as cold as a fire, Drake. We fight to win and win we shall, but I want no more dead. We nodded, for he was right. As soon as King Swain and his ships arrived at the rear of Long Serpent, then the battle would end. The others now did as I had already done and slipped their shields around their backs. It made it easier to clamber over gunnels. Griotard picked up a small hand axe, while the others all drew seaxes or short swords. Lodvir and our men had carved out an enclave on the ship which lay next to Long Serpent, and despite his apparent recklessness, he had organised the men to make a wall so that when we boarded we had no fighting to do. It gave us the chance to assess the situation on the last Drekker. King Olaf of Sweden held the bows of the great warship, but as the ship was forty-five paces long his success had not brought him any closer to King Olaf Tryggvason. We had another ship to cross before we could reach our king's enemy but survivors, few though they were from the other ships, had made their way to the surviving Norwegian ships. It would become harder for us all. Swain Skulltaker used the time to make another line of our strongest warriors. We gathered those with the best mail as Lodvir and the others wearied the men they were fighting. I think that the Norwegians had long ago given up any hope of victory. They were just fighting now to take as many of us with them as possible. I knew, as my foster father did, that there would be no glory in this, and certainly no honour. We had become Forkbeard's human butchers. With a block of twelve of us, Swain one eye and I flanked his father. The Hersier shouted, Aeron! Charge! Lodvir shouted, Break! It was a tactic we had practised, and the men alongside whom he had fought all lunged and then turned to the side. Their opponents, who were weary already, were too stunned to move, and our wall of steel simply broke them. Oathsword and my long dagger both drew blood. The men who died had resignation in their eyes. They knew they were dying, and they all held tightly to their swords to be guaranteed entry to Valhalla. Their king might be a Christian, and some wore a cross, but at the end, when things really mattered, it was the old ways that gave a man hope. We were suddenly at the side of Long Serpent, and we were faced with a wall to climb. Before we could consider how to do it, warriors appeared behind us. It was Jarl Sven Harkonnason and his men. They had fought their way across the other ships to join us. He greeted our Hersir, who gave a half bow. After all, the man was a Norse, and they were the ones we were fighting. You and your men have done a magnificent job, Hersir. King Olaf is my enemy. We will lead this attack. It was a command, and as such had to be obeyed. I did not mind, but I saw from his fiery eyes that Griotard did. Swain Skulltaker took the sting out of the order. 
And we, of course, will follow you, Jarl Sven Harkonnesen, so that we can bring this battle to a speedy end. I would expect nothing less from the men of Eirhorn and the warrior with the dragon sword. You have lived up to your reputation, Swain Skulltaker, and that is rare. While we waited to climb, I saw that the Norns had been spinning once more, for the first ten of Jarl Sven Harkonnesen's men who tried to board the huge trekker were slain, and their bodies hurled back to the deck where we stood. That would have been the Herseer and the hearth whereu had the Jarl not arrived. I kissed the hilt of oath sword in thanks. It took longer for the Jarl to reach the deck of the great ship than he had expected, and he turned when he reached it. I think, Dean, that I shall need your help now, for my best warriors are fallen. When we ascended the side of Long Serpent we were greeted with a sight that looked nothing like any deck I had ever seen before. The height of the gunnel had allowed us to see the King of Sweden at the prow, but it had not prepared us for the sea of bloody bodies which covered the deck. Two of the Jarl's Hearthweru lay there, and I saw that he and the survivors of his attack had a tiny enclave. They were fighting for their lives. This was the king's ship, and still aboard it were the finest of his warriors. All wore the best mail and had fine helmets and weapons. They still retained their shields, and I estimated that there were more than twenty-five of his best warriors gathered before him. His lesser warriors were closer to the prow and were fighting the king of Sweden. Once more it was Swain Skulltaker who took command. Lodvir, take half of the men and make a wedge of warriors to our left. We will support Jarl Svein Hakonason. Aye, Herr Seer. He turned to the ones he had selected aboard the last trekker. When I give the command, we drive along the gunnel to support the Jarl. I saw his cleverness in those simple orders. Jarl Svein Hakonason was surrounded and Lodvia's men would give him protection from the left. By attacking the men on the Jarl's right and using the gunnel to protect our right, we would be able to stretch the Norse defences. The warriors we faced would fight until night fell if necessary. Ayaron! The Jarl's men heard us coming, and the ones on the right still fighting shifted back, echeloning their line. It meant that we hit the right side of the mighty hearthweru and oathsworn of King Olaf Tryggvason. They were truly great warriors, but as Swain One Eye, his father, and Oathsword all struck the two huge warriors, even their mail and strength could not stop our swords causing such wounds that the two Norse shields were dropped, and when Oathsword drove up under the arm of one to appear at the other side of his neck, Bersi the Strong finally went to Valhalla. Swain Skulltaker's sword hacked through the throat of the other, and suddenly we had a more solid line of warriors. Lodvir's movement meant that Jarl Sven Harkonason and his men now filled the drekker to the steerboard gunnel. There were two battles. Behind us were the Swedes, battling the bulk of the Norse, and there were two small groups of warriors facing each other. King Swain Forkbeard had managed to bring his ships to board the Norse, but it was not Long Serpent. He was four Drekkers away. It was Jarl Sven Harkonnason who spoke as both sides stepped apart to recover a little. Such events often happened in battle. It was as though the two sides mutually agreed to rest to make a final battle worthy of remembrance. King Olaf Tregvason, you have lost. The battle is over. You cannot win. The king laughed. And you expect me to surrender to a backstabbing traitor? Do not think that I do not know why my ships did not follow me. Had I brought the full force of my ships to bear, then the sea would be filled with the wreckage of Danish and Swedish trekkers. Try to take me, Jarl Sven Harkonnesen, and you will see that my oath sworn have even more reason to hate you. It was as he spoke that I saw that he too held a dragon sword. That was strange, for he was a Christian. Perhaps, like his men, he still had a pagan heart. We stood facing each other in silence. 
Around the king the deck was bloody but clear of bodies. The king was protected by four of his crew with shields, but the rest, the real warriors, were in one line. Then one warrior nodded and the Norse ran at us. Some of them had shields, but others were like me and had two weapons. I was still next to the Hersir, and I would be fighting. It never occurred to me that I might die, even though the men who came to kill us were the best that the Norse had left. Swain, One Eye, and I were there to protect the Hersir, and nothing else mattered. The warrior who came at me was the same height as I was, but he was broader. He had a hand axe and a sword. The worst thing I could have done would have been to stand and await the blows, and so I stepped forward to close the gap. The Norwegian brought the axe down in a swing to strike my head while his sword, held in his right hand, came up to stab me in the neck. That suited me, for while such a blow might buckle a lesser sword, Oath's sword would take the blow easily. When my sword stopped the axe, I saw the look of surprise on the face of the Norseman. Slivers of wood were peeled from the haft. He had seen a youth and expected fear. My left hand acted instinctively and I deflected the sword which scraped along the Hersia's mail. While the man was still surprised, I turned the long dagger and drove it towards the Norse's thigh. He had a split burney and my blade drove into his thigh. I twisted and pulled. As his leg buckled a little, I punched him in the face with the hilt of Oath's sword. At the same time, I rammed my knee between his legs. It increased the flow of blood as well as making the Norseman double in pain. I have quick hands, and inverting the sword I drove it into his neck. Go to the old father. You have done your duty. I looked to my left and saw the Hersia fighting another mighty warrior, while Alf and Griotard fought the tallest Viking I had ever seen. My duty was clear. The warrior fighting Swain Skulltaker had a shield, but the folds of his burney allowed me to slice into muscle, slide along the bone, and then drive through his body to the other side. As his arm fell and I withdrew Oath's sword, Swain Skulltaker ended his life. There was now a gap between us and the king, and it was tempting to rush forward, full of the joy of battle, and fight with the king. I had no wish to die, and I knew that I would die if I attempted such a thing. Others were still fighting, and until his oath sworn were killed, then the king was safe. I saw Griotard slump to his knees and knew that it must be a serious wound, for he was a hard and tough warrior. The Norseman turned his attention to Alf, who was struggling to defend against the mighty warrior. His sword had bent a little. I dropped my dagger, and taking oath sword in two hands, swung it into the back of the Norseman who was about to take Griotard's life. He had the best of mail, and I only broke a dozen or so links, but the force was enough to hurt his spine, and as his head came up, Alf drove his sword through the Norseman's neck. Take Griotard to safety. I will stay. You are hurt. Do as I say, Alf. There are others to take your place. Even as I spoke, Dreng and Aestin stepped forward with Folke close behind. Alf obeyed. I heard King Forkbeard shout, Tregvassen is mine! He was clambering over the gunwale of Long Serpent to join us. As the last of the oath sworn was slain, King Olaf Tregvassen, using a stay for support, stepped onto the gunwale. He was defiant to the end. Ah, I'm King Olaf Tregvassen, and I die not through an honourable defeat in battle, but by the hand of treachery. I will not give a treacherous dean the glory of my death, and I curse you, Swain Falkbeard. You shall never know peace. Many men say that the king died a Christian, but I saw that he clutched the sword in two hands as he threw himself over the side, his mail, boots and weapons guaranteeing that he would die, and I knew that he hoped the Christian heaven would be Valhalla. That was not the end of the battle. The men who had followed King Olaf Tryggvason on this voyage to the next world fought to the end and were butchered where they stood. There was great slaughter on both sides. It was, however, the end of our battle, and as Long Serpent, 
damaged from all sides and below the waterline, began to sink. We headed back to our own ships. As we boarded Sea Serpent, we saw the sea take the greatest warship ever built. There would never be another like it. As the sun set, we saw that all eleven Norse ships had been sunk, but there were twenty-five of our Drekka to keep them company. Many of the Danish and Swedish Drekka which headed home had barely enough men to man the oars. We had lost five men killed, as well as Griotard and two others with wounds serious enough to keep them from the oars. We rode west in silence, for the sea seemed filled with the dead of a bygone era. I did not think there would ever be a sea battle like this one. And when the island of Svolder hove into view and we sought a berth, I for one was glad that it was so. Chapter 2 Griotard's wound needed attention, and we lit a good fire to help us to see the problem. His left thigh bone had been cracked by an axe head. It was a wound that would change Griotard's life. He would be able, when it healed properly, to row, and he would be able to stand in a shield wall. But he would be a liability in a battle, for he would not be able to move quickly, and his movements would be impaired. As his friend, Londlier the Long, tended his wound, the two of them spoke of this. My life as a warrior is over, Lodvir. This life as a warrior is over, but there are other things you can do. He laughed sardonically. Oh, you mean watching Ayrhorn with the other old men and cripples? No, thank you. If you think you were crippled, then that is sad, but it is not what I meant. I need a captain for my Drekker. I need someone who can navigate but also fight. Is that you, or are you too crippled for that? That is the way old friends can talk to each other. Is this because you feel sorry for me? Lodvia laughed. Feel sorry for you? You are alive. There are many at the bottom of the sea who would change places with you. Then I accept. He looked up at Alf. Sorry that I almost caused you to be skewered, lad. It was fortunate that Saxon sword here has a quick arm and a strong one. Alf shook his head and smiled. It was my own fault, for I was still thinking of the moment I won my name. My father was right when he said to concentrate on fighting the man before me. Griotard laughed and then grimaced as the laugh made his leg hurt. Aye, I forgot to give you your full title. Alf the Swooping Hawk. Generally, we referred to Alf from then on as either Swooping Hawk or simply Hawk. It was his mother and father who still used the name Alf, although when we went to war, his father called him Hawk. Swain One-Eye said, And did you name your new weapon, Sven? I nodded. Norse gutter, for it did its job well. They were hard men. Lodvir nodded as he finished bandaging Griotard's injury. Aye, and I did not enjoy slaughtering them. They did their duty, as did almost every other warrior, but it still did not feel honourable. Every eye was drawn to the fire of the king and Jarl Svein Hakonason. The captains who had survived were there now reporting to him. His name was not spoken, but every warrior knew that King Svein Forkbeard had a bloodless sword. He was a hard man for a warrior to be loyal to. Carl Three Fingers arrived and said, The king wonders why ye are not in his presence, Lodvir the Long. Lodvir stood and looked his old comrade in the eye. I was tending to a warrior who fought Olaf Tryggvason's oath sworn and thought that a more immediate priority. He sheathed the dagger he had used to improvise a splint. Had the king been closer to the battle, he would have known that. Carl sucked in air through his teeth. I am an old friend, Lodvir the Long, and I know you meant no ill, but there are others who would have taken offence at your words. Tread carefully. Lodvir smiled. Am I not among friends now? Shaking his head, the old warrior said, Come, you have traders' patience. 
the two left for the king's fire. Griotard looked to be asleep, and Alf the swooping hawk asked, Do we need a king? Griotard's voice made us jump when he spoke. There were many who thought we did not need one in the same way that there were many who did not agree with Harald Finehair making a throne in Norway. The ones who fought both kings went to the west in the Isle of Ice and Fire and beyond. We chose to stay, and that means that we bend our backs and necks a little. Let us see what the two kings make of Norway. For myself I know not why they wish it. There is little farmland, and half of the country is under snow and ice for half of the year. He sighed. Keep your voices down. Not only does it keep me awake, but there are ears close by who would love to tell King Swain of disloyalty. If you think you live in a land where a man may voice his opinion, then you are wrong. I said in a quiet voice, Cousin, we are Hearthweru. We have no opinion save that of our hersier. What does Swain Skulltaker think about this matter? Hawk looked confused. I know not, for I have not asked him. Swain One Eye ruffled his brother's hair. Brother, today you showed you are brave. But sometimes I wonder if you are from our family at all. Listen to our cousin, who is wise beyond his years. Do as Griotard said, and keep your mouth shut, else the swooping hawk might be better named the cackling cockerel. It was such a funny image that all of us laughed, and it eased the tension. We had fought all day, and we were all weary, but none could sleep. In the case of the Hearthweru, part of that was the absence of the Hersir. We had to wait until he returned before we could position our bodies around his when he slept. However, even had I been an ordinary warrior, I would have found it hard to sleep. My dreams would have been filled with the butchered, bloody bodies I had seen aboard the Norse ships. It was a waste. Had the three kings put aside their differences, then we could have sailed to England, and after we had destroyed their army, been the richest warriors the world had ever known. For England was richer than all save the Eastern Empire. King Swain's wife's hatred of Olaf Tryggvason had made our king blind to the possibilities we had. Siegfried, the haughty, was a vengeful woman, and the slight done to her by King Olaf had been paid for with the deaths of hundreds of Norsemen. Men were still talking of the battle and the famous warriors they had seen die when Lodvir and my foster-father returned. They had been away so long that some had feared King Swain meant to do them harm. Carl Threefinger's words had been ominous. However, the two were smiling as they entered the firelit camp. They both went to see Griotard. He was the only one who had succumbed to sleep, but we had plied him with strong ale and he had almost collapsed. The two stood over him. He fought well today, Lodvia. Too well. I fear that if we use him in a shield wall, he will be the one who slows us. Then we use that, and Griotard becomes an anchor, Swain Skulltaker stretched. Alf, ale. My cousin had a filled horn ready almost before the words had died, and I poured one for Lodvir, who smiled his thanks. He raised his horn. Men of Reba and Eirhorn, let us drink to the dead. The dead. Lodvir grinned as he added, and to the new Jarl of Reba and Eirhorna, Swain Skulltaker. My foster father was ever a modest man, and to deflect some of the cheers and praise with which he was showered, he said, And to the new hairseer of Eirhorna, Lodvia the Long. The news guaranteed that it would be some hours before we slept. It was Lodvia who told us what had happened at the king's camp. It became clear that the king had been anxious for what amounted to a court to be ready before he spoke, hence Karl's urgency. The two kings must have already divided Norway in anticipation of victory. 
Men will say that the odds we had in our favour guaranteed that we would win. But they were not there. Jarl Svein Harkonason would rule the parts of Norway given to Denmark, and confirmed that the motives for the battle were personal and had nothing to do with the land. Jarl Svein Harkonason would supply men when we went to war. It had been the Jarl, as well as Karl and many of the other Drekker captains who had first asked and then demanded that Swain Skulltaker be given the title of Jarl. Jarl Harald's sons had died fighting with their father and there was no other who could have been given the title. That the king had been reluctant was curious, but Lodvir explained it away. Swain here is a modest man, but others can see what he cannot, that he is the most popular Dane, and men would happily follow him to battle. He has shown in every war we have fought that he is resolute and brave and does not let his comrades down. The king fears him. He sees a potential rival for the crown. Swain Skulltaker has no desire to be king, but those who take a crown fear that others will have the same view. We will be given the hardest tasks in any war. It was then that Swain finally spoke. I am not saying I agree with all that Lodvier said. He talks far more than I would have done, and speculates without knowing all. I will say that I was reluctant to accept the title. I told the king that I will not live in Rib. The home of the Ayrhon clan is where I shall continue to live, and now that we have made it stronger, I would be a fool not to do so. Lodvier will live there, for I know it will be in good hands. I was a little sad, for I would not see as much of the man who had made me the warrior I was. He then shook his head as he continued. This battle cost us men and ships. Stormbird was just one of many which sank. If there was any profit to be had, then it sank beneath the waves. That was not quite true, for while the King of Sweden had destroyed the last of King Olaf's men, we had taken coins, swords, helmets, and other weapons from the Oathsworn. Better that we have them than the fishes. While we were all awake, Jarl Svein gave us more information about what we would do in the future. We have a winter to prepare, for King Swain intends to spend the next raiding season in Wessex. There we will make the profits that will see us enriched. We have the next months to train warriors and to repair the damage to our drecker. Ramming such a fine vessel into another one can do it no good. Enjoy this night. For tomorrow we begin to become not just the warriors of Ayrhon, but Reba and Ayrhon. The next time we go to war there will be more than one hundred and fifty spears following my banner. We need those men to be of the quality I see before me, the warriors who won the Battle of Svalder. It was a stirring speech, and we sat up until the dawn was almost upon us, talking of the future. When I went to sleep, my mind was filled not only with future battles and Wessex, but also Mary. If I was going to England again, then our future must be decided. Thorsten the Lucky kicked us awake, and when I opened my eyes I saw that Swain Skulltaker was no longer there. I rose with a start. Thorsten grinned. A poor start for the hearth weary of a yarl, Sven Saxon sword. He's aboard the ship already. Still, my ship's boys are handy should many make an attempt on his life. I shook one eye and hawk. Come, the Jarl has gone. My foster father was smiling as we boarded the Drekker. The king and many of the other Drekker had sailed already and the ship's boys were preparing the ship for sea. We would raise the mast once the rest of the crew were aboard. There were just five warriors aboard. Griotard and four of the Reba men who had survived. Sleepy heads, eh? I spoke for the others. Sorry, Jarl Swain Skulltaker. It will not happen again. He laughed. The title has not changed me, and I care not if our king takes it away. If I am not safe aboard my own ship, then I am safe nowhere. 
You three showed yesterday that you were a wise choice for Hearthweru. I was able to do what I did because I knew that the three of you guarded me, and that helps the rest of the clan. You three must stay alive while you live, then we shall win. He looked at his youngest son, and you. No more heroics. You have a name, and be satisfied with that. A spear held aloft could have ended your life, and no father should bury his son. Swain and Sven show you how to fight, with courage and fortitude, but not recklessness. I had spoken to Hawk, and knew that even as he had leapt he had regretted his action. But by then it was too late to undo it. On a more positive note, the three of us had sat and begun to compose the saga of the swooping hawk, and we hoped by the winter solstice to have it ready. We had other chants and songs, but they were of the past. The Battle of Svolda had been too dark a chapter to be commemorated in a song, but Alf's action merited one. Our two ships finally left the island at noon. Our departure was marred as we found ourselves sailing through not only broken pieces of wreckage, but bodies and body parts. The battle would throw up its reminders through the next months, and I, for one, was glad that living on the other coast of Denmark, we would not see them. In fact, the journey back was one of constant reminders, for we had sailed to the battle in a fleet led by Jarl Harald, and the sea had seemed crowded. Now we led Hyrokin and it seemed empty and lonely. There were ships ahead of us, but we could not see them, and others who would be following. So for two days and nights it was as though our two ships were alone. We called in at Riba to let ashore those survivors who had crewed with us, and to tell the Jarl's wife and daughters of the deaths in battle of their men. They would continue to live on the Jarl's lands, for he had many thralls. They would not be poor, but they would have changed it all for the return of their menfolk. I knew this, for my mother had said so when my father and brothers had died. He also took the opportunity to tell the burghers that he was the new Jarl, and that Lodvir the Long would rule in his stead. We left for the short voyage home after a brief visit. I do not think that Jarl Harald's family needed us there. It was their time to grieve and to remember. The time for conversation would come, but not yet. We were our own harbingers, and when the folk of Ayrhon saw the sail, they would rejoice. But, as I knew from when I had stayed at home, they would fear that while the crews returned, their loved ones might not. The mighty horn would sound, and families would leave the stronghold and make their way down to the jetty and quay. I felt especial sadness as my mother would not be there to greet me. Sometimes she had been too ill to make the jetty, but until this return I had always known that I would see her. And now I knew I would not. The whole crew seemed to have similar sombre thoughts, and we tied up in silence. Those waiting for us were silent too as they waited to see a face they sought. When the families of our dead saw that their father or husband was not returned, there would be a wail. The others would not cheer, but the hugs and embraces would be all the more powerful for that. We each took our shields from the side of the Drekker. Our chests could wait, but it was bad luck to leave shields on a Drekker in your own port. The figurehead was also removed by Thorsten the Lucky. The Jarl was the first off. None knew of his title, and he would not speak to the clan until he had told his wife. As he stepped off, every warrior banged their shield with the hilt of their dagger. It was like Thor's thunder. Still banging our shields, the Hearthweru followed him. I was the last of the three. The Jarl and his family quickly moved off to allow others to disembark, and I slipped my shield over my shoulder so that I could hurry home. I saw Mary, and behind her, Egbert. For no reason that I could tell, she suddenly burst into tears and ran at me. Throwing her arms around my neck, she planted a kiss and lifted her feet from the ground. I kissed her back, and Lars and Leif whooped with joy behind me. 
Her tears had wetted my face, and when she descended to the ground she looked up at me and said, See how you have made me a wanton. My father will be an unhappy man. I nodded. Then let us remedy that. We shall be married as soon as we can. She beamed and then frowned. A hand-fast marriage in the Danish style? I laughed. I care not. In any way you wish. If you can find a priest, then in the Christian manner. I do not worry how we marry, just so long as we are wed and can be one. We will find a priest. The hall seemed empty without my mother, but I knew as I entered that this was my hall now and mine to do with as I chose. I had a winter to make it my own. Then I realised it would belong to Mary and me. It would be ours to change. After Egbert and the other thralls had fetched my weapons and chest, I bathed, for I stank of blood, seawater and sweat. Mary and her women prepared the evening meal. I invited Egbert to eat with us, for I needed his advice and knowledge. He was a little embarrassed to be dining with us, but Mary made it easy and often deferred to him. Egbert, I shall be home until the spring. I saw Mary frown. That was a bridge I had yet to cross. Before I go, I wish to ensure that my lands and my hall be left in a healthy state. Until this moment, I have spent my whole time worrying about a sword. I can see now that Oath Sword is part of my life and not the whole thing. Both nodded and smiled. Mary and I are to be wed, and that means we will have children. I wish my hall to reflect that. Have the thralls work with Mary to make it easier for all when there are young Svens and Marys in it? Aye, Lord. It will mean cleaning out parts which have remained unused, and we can make better, more solid partitions. He hesitated and said, In a Saxon style, You will not offend me by doing so. How are we for livestock? We could do with more pigs, and a man can never have enough sheep. Then we will go to Reba and buy more when the livestock markets reopen. He nodded. And crops? More land could be cultivated, but we do not have enough hands to work it. I will fetch more thralls. A thought had occurred to me as I had sailed home. There is one thing more, Egbert. I would give you your freedom. You shall be paid for running my lands. I paused and realised I had made assumptions. Of course, as a free man, you could return across the seas to your home. He shook his head. I thank you for the gift of freedom, Lord. It has oft been a dream, and your mother promised it towards the end of her life. I have no family there now, and my only family are yourself and your good lady. Mary put her hand on mine. That was well done, Sven. It was not, Mary, for it had been well done if I had done it when my father died, for Egbert was his thrall. There is a priest in Reba, Lord. He can wed you. How do you know? When your father would visit with his friend Jarl Harold and took me to watch his horse, I would sneak off so that Father Oleg could hear my confession. I nodded. Before we can arrange a marriage, then I need to seek the permission of Svein's skulltaker. Of course. The next morning seemed an appropriate time to do so, but as word got out that he had become Jarl, then his hall was crowded with those wishing to congratulate him. While there were others, the ones who were not warriors but merchants and farmers, who sought to profit from the news. I waited a while and tried to catch his eye, but it was impossible and I joined Hawk and One-Eye outside the hall. I gave them my news, and they were delighted. My cousin Swain said, Go and speak with my father, for he will like this news. I know that he approves of Mary. We all do, for she has been good for you. Good for me? They both laughed, and he continued, Aye, you were withdrawn and quiet when your father died. That was why my father put you with Siggy, for he too was a quiet and reflective youth. 
We all knew that he would not last many voyages, but it mattered not. Mary took his place, and once she came into your life, you smiled more. I, said Hook, and became a better warrior. Shaking my head, I said, You give me more credit than I deserve. Swain said, When Greatard was wounded, who took command? You did. You were a different warrior now, and that is down to two things, Orth sword and Mary. When you marry her and have children, you will change again. I know that the birth of my son had a profound effect upon me. Before we could continue our conversation, Lodvir came out of the hall and made for us. We all stood. Were we to have a duty? Sven, the Jarl knows that you wish to speak with him and he has dismissed the throng. As we passed the disappointed farmers and merchants who emerged, I asked, But how? You are hearth Weru, Sven, and Sven knows that you would not bother him with something trivial. The merchants who asked for trading rights with Reba can wait. They did not put their bodies before the Jarl to defend him, and you did. I saw that Agnetha was next to the newly promoted Jarl, and she looked queen-like. I thought then of those comments I had heard about Swain's skull-taker as a better king. Agnetha was certainly a better queen than Forkbeard's Siegfried the Haughty. I am sorry to disturb you, foster father, and my request could have waited. Agnetha smiled. Modest as ever, Sven and such behaviour endears you to all. Bercy and your mother brought you up well. What do you wish to ask your foster father? I would marry Mary, daughter of Stiena. Even as they smiled, I went on hurriedly, and we would be wed by a Christian priest. Swain laughed as he stood to embrace me. Many men might say that you were doing this to ingratiate yourself with King Swain Folkbeard, but I know you, my son, and it is because Mary the Christian asked you to do so. Of course you have my permission, and on the morrow when Lodvir and I travelled to Reba, you should come with us and make the arrangements with the priest. Agneta came to hug me too. Your mother would be happy. It is just a shame she is not here to see it. I felt guilty. Events conspired against me, my lady. The wars and... Swain nodded. Do not apologise, Swain, for this is not your fault. Once again we will have to go to war and have but a few months of peace, and so we should make the most of it. When you are married in Reba, we shall hold a feast here. We shall celebrate the marriage and the fact that so many of us are still alive. And so, quicker than any might have expected, we were wed. The priest, happy to accommodate the new Jarl, married us on the eve of the autumnal equinox when the seasons and the days were in balance. The Jarl, Agneta, Lodvir and Egbert were the only witnesses, and they were all that was needed and then we came back to the new mead hall where we could really celebrate. Unlike the last feast, I drank as sparingly as was allowed for many reasons, not least that I did not wish to miss a moment of the day. As was expected, we were the first to retire, and we entered a hall emptied of all but us two. The thralls and Egbert would return the next day, but our first night was spent alone. I know not what I expected, but the two of us found, to our mutual delight, that we were made for each other in every sense of the word. The night seemed to last forever and was over in an instant, or so it seemed. To me that was magic, but my Christian wife said it was just a sign of true love. Egbert and the thralls must have ghosted in, for we did not hear them until it was almost noon. Egbert gave a discreet knock on the newly erected wooden partition between our bedroom and the main hall. Lord, we have food to break your fast. Should we return later? 
Mary and I had been awake for some time and she lay in my arms. She looked up at me and said, Perfect timing, for I am hungry. She raised her voice. Egbert, we will rise and eat at the table. Hi, my lady. In that moment, order was established in my hall, which was no longer mine. It was Mary's, and that was as it should be. It had been my mother's, and now it was my wife's. Weird. It seemed that there were not enough hours in either the day or the night. Mary was enthusiastic about changing the hall, as I was about the land, and each day we worked with Egbert and the thralls to shape it to the way we wanted to. Although exhausted, each night was also a joy. By the time it was the harvest Blutfist, my shield brothers had had enough of my absence and forcibly took me to the mead hall for the celebration. Mary did not object, although I was sure that she did not approve. I found that I needed the night of drinking, although in a more moderated manner than my two shield brothers, and talking with the two men I trusted most in the world with revelations about the joys of marriage. Poor Hawk was bemused, for one eye understood it all, but Hawk could not. I knew that just as a first battle was a rite of passage that changed the warrior, so marriage made a man from a boy. Just before I returned to my hall, one eye said, What, Sven, as much as we all rejoice in this newly found happiness, remember that you are Hearthweru, and we have a duty to train the young warriors. I know we have skills, but they are nothing compared to yours. My one eye does not impair my skills, but I cannot pass on those skills to young men as well as you. Alfear is keen, but he is no swordsman, and besides, they want to be trained by the warrior who wields oath sword. Lodvir is now at Ribbe, and Griatard's wound means that he is slow, and even novices can dance around him. Give us your mornings, eh? He was right, and I had been remiss. The last time I had drawn a sword had been the Battle of Svolda, and that had been three moons since. I will give you the morning, and I am sorry, brothers, you should have spoken earlier. Hawk looked glum. We would, but our mother gave us the sharp edge of her tongue. If anything, it cuts deeper than it used to. One Eye and I laughed. There were just twelve young men who needed to be trained. One Eye and Hawk had chosen the Harvest Blutfeast because until then the numbers who presented themselves for training varied with the needs of their farms and fishing boats. With the harvest in, and days becoming shorter, all twelve were available almost every morning, and that made life easier. The two most promising were Dreng Edelson and Snorri Sigmundsson. Every Dane we trained had skills, for their fathers and brothers had begun to train them from when they could stand. But these two had greater strength than the others, and in Dreng's case quick reactions which were almost as fast as mine. We used blank spear shafts and wooden swords to minimise the risk of serious injury. As I had discovered when I had begun training, a blow from a wooden sword hurt, but it would not cause a life-threatening wound. As they would be fighting alongside the rest of the clan eventually, we made them fight closely together. It was harder that way, but taught them to use shorter swings and to be aware of their comrades next to them. Having four of us to train them certainly helped, for two were able to direct individuals, while the other two could ensure that they stayed together. We used Dreng in the centre of one line and Snorri in the other. They quickly learned to command the others, and that too helped. We used spears and shields followed by swords and shields. When we moved on to spear on spear and sword on sword, it highlighted the difference between those who would be adequate warriors and those who would be good. I found that training the young men did me good, and when Griotard the Grim suffered a winter coughing spell and had to stay in the hall, I took charge, and that helped even more. I was able to hone the skills of the potentially better swordsmen. Oathsword had done many things for me, but the most important was to give me more confidence. 
I trusted the sword in battle, and that allowed me to be subtle in the way I struck. I found that sometimes the edge would be the most effective stroke, while at others the tip would be useful. I had even learned to use the flat of the sword, for that would blunt the enemy sword, and sometimes buckle it without making any difference to oath sword. All of them wanted to best me, even though I was using just a wooden sword. I had a reputation, and I was something of a legend. My defence of the Drekker in the Seine was an oft-sung song. Dreng and Snorri tried everything they could to beat me, but neither ever managed to strike a blow while they had to endure bruises from every encounter. As the winter equinox approached and we headed back to the hall, Snorri asked, How did you become so good so quickly, Sven? for my father said that you were still little more than a boy. I heard one eye suck in his breath at the insult, but I did not take it as one, and I answered as honestly as I could. There were boys in the clan who bullied me. It made me stronger, and when I was thrown into battle, I found that I had to fight just to survive. Then I found Oath's sword, and the blade protected me. I know that I was lucky, and not every man will find a dragon's sword. All the boys nodded as though it confirmed what they had heard. Dreng said, And you were chosen. Farabir was one of the Christians. But is that not a pagan belief? God says that we should turn the other cheek. One eye said coldly, Do that in battle, Faramir, and not only will you die, but in all likelihood the two shield brothers next to you. This was an argument that often raged, for those who converted to Christianity were conflicted by the pacifist nature of their religion and the need to fight to defend themselves. I took out Oath Sword. As usual, it had a profound effect, for every eye was drawn to it. This sword was ordered to be made by one of the most Christian kings, King Alfred of Wessex. He and his men fought our people and won. When they did so, then King Guthrum was converted. They still fought for their land and their families. I am not a Christian, but I believe that the words turn the other cheek are meant to ensure harmony in a home. They are not intended to leave a people weak and defenceless. I sheathed the sword and said, Swain One Eye is right, Faramir, you cannot hold such views in battle. Better that you tell the Jarl you would rather not fight in the shield wall. Not all men go to war, and there is no shame in staying in Eirhan. He flushed, for we were nearing his home, and he shook his head. No, and you have explained it well. I see the difference. He turned to the others. I will not let any of you down. It was the middle of Morsugur when Mary gave me the news that she was with child. She had been a little unwell when the Christians had celebrated the birth of their Christ, and I had feared she had some illness. She had consulted the wise women of the clan for advice. It was Mary who called them wise women. We called them vulva, or witches. The choice of the word made it easier for Mary to visit them. When she told me then I was happy beyond belief, and then immediately fearful. When will the child be born? She shrugged. The wise women think that I conceived in the first month of our marriage, for they said I was young and healthy, as were you. They said the month you call Skirpla. I think that is the same as our May. I worked it out with my fingers. I nodded, and my face fell. What is wrong, husband? I shall not be here, for then I will be raiding with the king. She gave me a sad smile. And if you were here, then what could you do? You would run around like a headless chicken and panic. Birthing is a time for women and not men. I shook my head. I could be here and hold your hand. I could be at your side. She looked suddenly shocked. There, when I give birth. Are you mad? It is a place for women who know of such things. Men know war. I accept that. Women understand other things. I know that you must go to war and it will give me time to become a mother. 
I can make mistakes, and none shall know it but I. There are some good women in your village. Since we have wed, they have shown me great kindness. Agneta is a good lady, and she said she will be at the birthing. Agneta knows. Laughing, she said, Of course, there are no secrets between the women. When you sail away on your warship, it is the women who rule Eirhamma, and Agneta is the queen. She is the one who keeps calm and order. She is the dispenser of justice and wisdom. It was your mother who taught me the order of things and of life in this stronghold. Go to war, but come back soon, and come back whole. Chapter 3 We did not have to travel to the court of the king to discover our orders. Carl Threefingers fetched them. Having delivered them and returned to the king, Griotard had given us the cynical reason for that. The king does not like us, and he would rather keep us isolated. I think he regards us as a sort of hunting dog, useful for bringing down enemies, but best kept on a steel leash and as far away from him as possible. Perhaps he was right. To be honest, it was better this way, for we did not have to travel down the Corduroy Road and endure the false faces of King Forkbeard and his court. We liked Carl, and away from the intrigues of Forkbeard he was a different man. Lodvir was summoned from Ribbe, and we gathered around a table in Swain Skulltaker's mead hall. As I sat with my cousins in the room, which was normally dark and full of bodies, I was able to enjoy the intricate carving on the roof supports and the beams. One normally did not see them, for at a feast your eyes were down, but not up. As we waited, I saw all the detail. The tree of stars, Yggdrasil, and the creatures of the heavenly world such as the messenger squirrel Ratatoskr, who to me also seemed like an animal version of Loki. The perching hawk, Verdurfolnir, now had a real relevance of Alf. The Norns were there too, spinning. On one side was Sol, the sun goddess, and on the other, Manni, the moon god. There was the goddess of earth, Jörð, as well as Dagr, the god of the day, and Nut, a Jutten of the night. Not that she would be invited, but Mary would understand none of this, and might even be fearful of what she saw as blasphemy. Karl, Lodvir, and our Jarl entered the hall, and we stood. Karl's oath-sworn were with him, and they guarded the door. What was to be said was a secret, but Swain Skulltaker knew that he could trust all the warriors of the clan. The merchants were a different matter. After the usual pleasantries, Karl began, and he smiled at us when he said, The king will not be leading this raid, ah, will. That brought smiles to our faces and made the rest of the commands far more palatable. Because we made war on the Norse last year, the lands to the west were not taxed. King Ethelred did not have to send Weigeld to us. It was foolish not to do so, for now we will take payments from him in thralls and gold. King Sween was pleased with the efforts of the men of Ribbe at Svolde, and it is your ships and twenty are bring from Hedebir, which will raid first Hamptonskir and then Denshir. We shall use the island close to Hamptonskir the one the Saxons call White as our base. There are no burrs there, and we can control the mouth of the river. How many ships can you bring? Swain Skulltaker rubbed his beard and looked at Lodvir, who held up his fingers. Seven ships. We lost four at Svalder, and with them their crews. Carl frowned and then shrugged. We will have to do with quality, then, and not quantity. Lodvir leaned forward. And the profits from this raid, how will they be apportioned? Two thirds for the king and his men, and a third for you. I knew that we would take more than that, for the payment of which Lodvir spoke would be the coin the Saxons paid for us to go, and that which we took from their churches. When we raided, Each Drekker crew would keep what it took from houses, towns, villages, and warriors. Swain said, 
When do we leave, and how long shall we be away? Carl frowned, and Swain smiled. I ask, because my foster son is to become a father. Will his bane be walking before he sees him? Carl nodded. We sail from Ribe at the start of Emmanadur, when the men of Wessex were but toiling in their fields, and will return at the end of Twimanadur, when we can take their harvests. Half a year, he nodded. And if we are away so long, do we need to pay taxes to King Thorkbeard? With no men working for half a year, it would be an unfair burden. The Saxons had no such option, and our raids would not only take coins from them, they would have to pay more taxes to keep us away in the future. Reba and Eigerhona will pay no taxes this year. We feasted that night, but it was a muted affair, for we did not have long to prepare. I told Mary not the places we would raid, for that was too personal, but the time I would be away, and she accepted it. She had changed since my mother had died and we had wed. She seemed less argumentative, and our life was more harmonious. The prospect of being a mother had changed her. Once more I wondered at my decision to delay wedding her. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. It is always perfect. We had more work to do with our twelve new warriors. Training stopped as we helped them to prepare weapons. Their fathers and families had given them a sword of some description, and some had bows, but they needed spears. We had spears we had taken from our enemies, but a warrior liked to have his own. The best heads were taken from the shafts of the captured spears, and we gave them to the youths. We took them to the woods where ash grew, and they each chose a shaft that they would trim and polish. We showed them how to sharpen the spearheads, and then each one finished them off themselves. The shields we had used had been training shields, and each needed work, for they would now be attached to a drecker. The four of us gave them advice, as well as showing them our own shields. By the time we were ready to sail, each of the twelve had a shield that was well painted and would afford protection in battle, for they were double-boarded, nailed and glued before having a cover of leather or sealskin. While the unmarried warriors feasted and drank the night before we sailed, I spent the whole time with Mary. This time it was not my mother who fussed that I had taken enough with me, but my wife. After I had returned from Svalda, she had Egbert collect as much fruit as they could. Cooked with honey and suet, and then sealed in waxed pots, it kept well. She had one such pot ready for me. It was a thoughtful gift. When we were at sea and eating either raw fish or salted meat, then a spoonful of the preserve tasted like nectar. The jars of pickled fish and venison were for my chest and would be my treat. That I would share them with my ore brothers was obvious, but they had been packed and prepared by my wife and that made them special. She had made my sealskin cape bigger so that I could sleep under it if I wished, and she packed spare kirtles and breeks. The squirrel hat might not be necessary, but it was good that I had it, and the sealskin cap would be useful. The sea across which we sailed was often beset with squalls and storms. Being dry made it just a little more bearable. Finally, she gave me a jar of salve she had made up. It was my mother's recipe, which Mary had adapted. The sea dried a warrior's hands, and while they could bear the discomfort, a scabbed hand could often become blackened and fingers might have to be removed. I had seen it happen to others. The salve was to ensure that we could row and fight. And, when you come home, there will be a child. I cannot promise you a warrior, but I will do all in my power to ensure that the child is healthy. Boy or girl, I care not. And I will name the child, which will be baptised as soon as they are born. There was finality in her words which told me that she would brook no argument. I gave her none. I knew the reason behind her vehemence. She wanted the child to go to heaven, and for that it needed baptism. If it was a boy, it would not affect his ability to be a warrior. 
that would lie in my hands. Whatever names you choose will satisfy me. One Eye's son is like his father and grandfather, Swain. Calling out the name Swain will be a nightmare one day. For some reason that made her laugh out loud, and after kissing me goodnight she was asleep. I lay awake for a short time. There was the slightest of bumps, and when I knew she was asleep and breathing steadily I placed my right hand on it and spoke softly. Child of mine, you are yet to be born, and if the Norns have spun I may not return to see you. Know that even in the afterlife I shall watch over you. I shall be the thought which guides your hand and your eye. If I fail to return, then know I love you, and I would have you watch and protect your mother, for she is the dearest person that I know. I leaned over and kissed the bump. Mary's arm came over around my neck, and that is how I fell asleep. Mary did not come to see me off. I knew that she would cry, and she did not wish that. Instead, it was Egbert, with two thralls carrying my chest, who came to see me off. Lord, Lady Mary will be safe while you are away. Lady Agnetha shows special interest in her. You and the warriors have made our home strong enough now, and we will be safe. When you return, there will be more animals, and your crops will be ready to harvest. God smiles on your union, and it's done my heart good to see the two of you together. It was your mother's dearest wish. It was the longest speech I had heard from my free man, and I smiled. And I never thanked you for watching both me and my mother when my father was away. Know that I appreciate all that you do. He nodded. The dark days were when I was first taken, and it was watching over you and your mother which brought joy and hope to me. I know now that God sent me here. You may still follow the pagan ways, Lord, but in your heart you are a Christian, and I take some of the credit for that. I did not believe him, and he had not seen me fight, but I knew that I was different from many of the warriors with whom I would sail. I knew that I was kinder and more considerate. Perhaps he was right. The Jarl and his Hathweru were the last to board, and as we set sail to head to the muster, the clan cheered. There were warriors left to watch our home. We had tried to persuade Griotard to be one, but he refused. There was also the next generation of young warriors who waved us off, and I saw the regret on their faces. They would be the ones we would train the next winter. Life at Ayrham was like a circle, but the world appeared to be changing. A few generations ago there had been no kings, and now they made decisions for us. How long would this circle remain unbroken? More than half a year had passed since we had rowed. We also had twelve new warriors seated on their chests, and when we began to row we were ragged. Griatard growled and grumbled as we headed past the outlying islands north to Ribbe. We used simple chance, and it brought a little bit of order, but we knew that once we joined the other ships of Ribbe we would all have to row better. When we reached Ribbe, the three of us would speak with the new crew and give them advice. Lodvir the Long had done so with me when I had first sailed, and I had a duty to do the same. Since Stormbird had been sunk, we were now the largest drekker in the Reba fleet. We had every oar double crewed, and in the case of the first three chests, triple crewed. It made for a crowded drekker, but one whose warriors would lead the line behind the Jarl and ahead of the men of the Reba coast. When we moored, the Jarl had a berth reserved for him, and we left Griotard to give the sharp edge of his tongue to the crew and headed for the Jarl's mead hall. It was now Lodvir's home, but Svein Skulltaker was not precious about such things. He had chosen to live with the Ayrhana clan in their settlement, and I knew that he did not regret his decision. Once we reached the hall, he said, I will be safe here with Lodvir. Until we sail, then your time is your own. He looked at his youngest son and gave him what we knew was the serious eye. 
Remember that you are the hearth of the Jarl. Behave accordingly. We all nodded, but one eye and I knew he was talking to Hawk. The last time we had been in Ribe, it had been Jarl Harald's town. Now it was Swain's skulltakers, and his hearth were accorded all sorts of courtesies and privileges I had never imagined. Those who sold items in the markets were desperate for us to take their wares. I knew why, for they could then tell others that the hearth of Swain's skulltaker used their carved eating spoon or decorated bowl. Had we wished, we could have taken enough drinking horns for the first two chests of rowers. We did not take from everything which was offered, but we would have offended had we not taken some of the proffered gifts. The alewives happily filled up our horns for free, and I saw that it was good business, for as we drank other warriors came to buy ale and ask us about the Battle of Svolda, or Oath Sword. We had entered a different world. We had thought to buy food, but we had no need. As we drank ale, the alewives sent platters of choice pieces of meat, fish and cheese, as well as warm bread covered in melting butter. Again, I knew why it was to make a profit for younger warriors thought to emulate us. They would spend their coins happily knowing they were in the company of veterans with names earned in combat. When we had been the hearthweru of a hersier, we had not been as important. Men had asked to see the dragon's sword, but that was all. Swain's skulltaker's elevation had elevated us. Our names were known. Warriors used the names as though we had known them for years, and yet they were complete strangers, and we did not know their names. By the time we returned to Sea Serpent, we were almost dizzy with the changes which had been wrought. The new warriors we had trained looked as though they had been used to clean the decks and had the look of chastened hounds. Griotard knew how to curse. We deposited our newly acquired wares in our chests and went to sit with them at the prow, the end reserved for novices. I remembered it well from my time with Siggy. I smiled. Griotard the Grim let you know that you were not the best of rowers. Snorri nodded miserably. We well, have not yet been to sea and no one told us how to row. Everyone seems to think that we know what to do without ever having been to sea. Faramir said, I was a ship's boy for one voyage and I had been to sea, but I did not know that rowing was such a hard thing to do. I smiled. You row in pairs. They nodded. And which four are at the four of you? Dreng, Snorri, Faramir and Gandalfur all raised their arms. You four just watch the warriors in front of you and copy them exactly. The rest can copy you. It is repetition, that is all. You slide the oar on the narrow side and then pull with the blade. When the others raise, you do. But you cannot be tardy nor delay for an instant. Today was an easy day for we sailed alone. Tomorrow or the day after, whenever we sail, we will be with a fleet and if we drop back, then the rest of the Reba fleet will too. If you thought Griotard was a grumpy bear awoken from his winter sleep too early... Then make a mistake before the other ships and you will see a bear whose cub has been taken. One eye laughed at the image and I knew that he would use it in a saga. Gandalfa said, What how can we row harder? He showed me his hands. They were red raw already. I shook my head. Did you pack your own chests? The looks they gave told me that they had not. Faramir said, I've made sure my weapons were at the top, but my mother and sisters packed the rest. Each of you open your chests and see what treasures the wise women of Eirhan have hidden for their foolish sons and brothers. It was as though they had discovered a chest of gold and jewels as they took out clothes, hats, capes and food. Then Dreng said, What is this? He held up a small pot. Open it. I saw others discovering equally intriguing items. Dreng opened it and wrinkled his nose. Mother has given me some food which has gone off. Laughing, Hawk went over to him and took a fingerful of it. 
he smeared it on Dreng's reddened hands. Dreng's eyes widened. He calls them? I nodded at the jar in the young warrior's hands. So, Gandalfer, when we raid the Saxons, find a good present to take back to your mother, for she knew that you would need her salve. Swain One Eye said, And we will not tell them that their sons were too foolish to find it. It marked a change in the young warriors. After they had soothed their hands, they examined everything and then repacked it. It was a lesson learned. Carl Three Fingers led the other ships into the harbour the next morning. His own ship, Fire Drake, was a large vessel. She had twenty oars on each side. Double crewed, it gave her more than eighty fighting men. At least half of them were mailed, and all were well armed. It was clear that these were the best of King Swain's men. His very best would be with him, his hearth weru bodyguards, but he was ensuring that Carl Three Fingers had men with him who could do the job. As the crews disembarked to visit Reba's market, I stood with Griotard. Hawk and his brother had gone to take Carl to their father, and the two of us estimated the men we would have when we raided. We have three hundred or so, roughly. There is one snecker there, and that shows Carl Three Fingers' wisdom. You need a sneaky little snake to go places they would spot a wrecker. I think that Carl had brought more than eight hundred warriors. This is not the largest warband the king has ever sent, but we are enough to raid as well as any warband, and we are led by a good man. I am hopeful, Sven. Griotard would not be sailing with us, but he and some of our crew would join Lodvir. Griotard would be the sailing master. Griotard was rarely optimistic, and it heartened me. Carl also showed that he would not waste one moment in port more than he had to. The winds were in our favour, but Swain Skulltaker still made a bloot before we sailed. Had the king been with us, then we would not have been allowed to, for it was not a Christian act. Carl just shrugged, and we set sail in three fleets. The lithe little snecker, Adder, sailed ahead of Fire Drake in the centre. We were the steerboard fleet, and one of King Swain's other jarls, Eric Mightyfist, led the other. It was a wise precaution. If a storm came upon us, then each group would be easier to reform, and we had waypoints already decided where we would wait. We were heading due west by south to make for the river the Romans had called the Dunham. It lay in the land colonised by our kin already, Northumbria, and we knew that there were friends in Jorovik. We would not necessarily land, but we sailed there, as it was the most direct route, and there would be no chance of Saxon ships and warriors waiting to pounce. If we had rowed the whole way, then we could have reached the estuary in two days and nights. We would not row all the way. We would use the sails when we could, and sail under reefed sails at night. We would row, but that was to harden the crews and to make them one. We reached the mouth of the river in five days. We spent a day there making minor repairs to some of the heather beer ships. Thorsten the Lucky was less than complimentary about their captains, for he knew that had they prepared for sea better, then no repairs would have been necessary. While we waited, some warriors went ashore to hunt the seals which basked upon the sands there. We even had time to render down some of the flesh to make oil while giving us both fresh food and skins. The bloot had been a good one. With all in good order, we sailed down the coast. Even our kin who lived there would be watching our sails warily as we edged along their sea. There were Danes who held the land all the way south to the Thames, but that did not mean that news would not be spread. Riders would already be heading inland to tell King Ethelred that a Danish fleet was close. The wolves were heading for the sheep pens. It took just under four days to reach the Isle of Sheep at the mouth of the Thames. Some captains questioned Carl's decision to land there, for it told the Saxons where we were. Swain Skulltaker not only approved, but he had also been party to the decision. When, as we roasted some of the sheep we had captured, 
One or two of the older warriors wondered why we had alerted the Saxons. Our Jarl explained as though to a child. We want the Saxons to know we are abroad, and even now in Londonwick they will be barring the gates and raising the levy. Further south, in Kent, the great churches will be ringing their bells to warn people that we are close. They will wonder where we will attack. They may even, although I doubt it, send ships and men down here to shift us. It matters not, for on the morrow we shall have vanished like the morning mist and they will wonder where we have gone. Their burrs will be manned, and all will go about armed. Aye, but we're still after land, and they will be ready. Bergil, do you know where we will land? The older warrior looked shamefaced. Wessex? Perhaps. But if you do not know for certain, then how will the Saxons know? They rely on their burrs to defend their people, but they can only stay there for so long. They have fields and animals to tend to. We will disappear from view, and they will watch the sea and see nothing. When we do reappear, it will be from the south and catch them unawares. It'll be like the shepherd boy who watches the sheep and shouts wolf too many times. We left well before dawn, and by the time the sun came up, we were well to the south and west of the easternmost tip of Kent. We sailed due south before heading directly west for a day across the sea, and then we headed north to the island which lay off the coast of Wessex. Our strange route meant we did not cross the path of any Saxon traders and were as good as invisible. The gods smiled on us, for it sent squally and wet weather. I was dry beneath my sealskin as we rode north, but with poor visibility and only those who had to be at sea, then the Saxons would be blind to our approach. It was Adda which left us and then raced north to find the beach we sought on the eastern coast of the Isle of Wight. The fire they lit to light our way ashore showed us that the landing site was safe, and we drew the boats up on the sand. The next part involved us. Lodvir had selected twenty warriors from the Reba and Eirhan, a contingent, and our job was to make our way north across the island. The Snecker crew would also sail around the island, and the intention was for us to head to Shamblord on the west side of the river Medun. With Adda blocking the river, we would destroy any boats we found and slay any defenders so that our ships could sail around and then hide in the river. We would be able to strike into the heart of Wessex and raid before the Saxons even knew we were there. The plan seemed to me to be flawless. There was pride involved as we slung our shields on our backs and hung our helmets from our spears. We had to be at Shamblord before Adder to secure the tiny fishing port, and I knew that the Snecker would be equally keen to beat us. Lodvir let me lead and he brought up the rear. The warriors who had been chosen were all the best. Lodvir's Hearthweru were with us, as were some of the other Hearthweru of the Reba Hirsius. It was dark, but I knew that all I needed to do was run north by west. When I reached a river, I would keep that to my shield side. The Allfather favoured us with a good moon. With cloaks over our mail, we would be hard to see, and the moonlight meant we could see, in the distance, the shining of its light on the water. Every five hundred steps or so I counted in my head. I would pause and glance around. Swain One Eye and Hawk were always close, and as the light showed me that Lodvir had not fallen back, I kept the same pace. I only stopped when I saw the two separate settlements of Shamblord. One lay on each bank of the river, and between them lay their boats. Our planning had been perfect, but it had assumed there would be just one settlement, or that the boats would only be on one side. This upset everything. The Norns had been spinning. We will have to wait for Ada. She can take the western village and we will take the eastern. Let us get into position. As we donned our helmets, he said, You did well, Sven. That was a good pace and none were left behind. I looked up to Lodvir, and his words meant a great deal to me. This time he led, and it was I who followed him. 
we could smell the wood smoke from the houses which lay close to the beach. These would be fisher folk, and with no wall around the huts showed that they did not expect to be attacked. There was no reason why they should, but they were in for a shock. We would not need our shields, and so we all left them on our backs, which allowed us to have two hands on our spears. I had not used Saxon Slayer at Swalder, but on the land it was another matter. The spear meant that even if the Saxons fought back, our weapons would be longer and certainly have a better head. Saxon Slayer was sharp enough to shave with, and even a glancing blow would be deep. We would take no chances, for the whole raid depended upon our success. When we were just a hundred paces away, there was a glow of light from one of the huts. Lodvir and I were on our knees so quickly that it would have seemed we had the same thought at the same time. We watched a fisherman come from his hut and make water in the vessel just outside the door. It would be used to kill lice on clothes before they were washed. We could hear his noise and it showed just how far noise travelled at night. I breathed a sigh of relief when he re-entered the hut. When we reached the huts, Lodvir waved his arms to spread us out. There were ten dwellings, and he assigned the men he knew best first. Some huts had two of us watching them, but the one I was given, the one closest to the beach, had just me as a sentinel. Lodvir pointed to me to keep watch to the estuary as I was the closest. Ada had made good time, and I think they must have rowed hard as well as using the sail. The sail was down when we approached the moored ships. There were four large vessels in the water and another ten drawn up on the beach close to me. The settlement on the other side of the river was smaller with just four dwellings and three boats. I waved my spear to attract their attention and Benny the captain waved back. I pointed the spear towards the other side of the river and he waved back. Along with Lodvir and the others I watched as the Snecker rode to the beach. Most of the crew disembarked, and four men rode the Snecker back to the middle of the estuary. We were ready, and having done my part I turned to face the door of the dwelling. I had done my part, and now we awaited Lodvir's command. I saw him wave his spear and I stepped towards the door of the hut. The huts were all identical. There was a crude door hung on leather hinges and an opening in the roof to let out the smoke. Made of wattle and daub, they were quick to make and easy to maintain. I pulled open the door and saw by the glow of the fire a family of what looked like six. There was a man and his wife under a blanket made of sheepskin and four children under a second. Before I could say anything, the man flashed open his eyes and sat upright. Had I chosen to, I could have slain him there and then, but Mary had changed me, and as I spoke perfect Saxon, I showed a more charitable side. Pointing Saxon Slayer in his direction, I said, Saxon, if you wish to die, then draw a weapon. If you wish to live, then stand and put your hands upon your head. You have my word that neither you nor your family will be harmed. He stood and spat out, And what is the word of a Viking worth? I would rather die fighting you. But that is not the Christian way, is it? My hand darted out and I scored a red line down his side with the spear. My friend, I could have killed you then. He heard the cries of others and the clash of steel. Not all had obeyed us. I am not alone. His wife reached up to touch his hand and she nodded to him. He put his hands on his head. Woman, bring me his weapons and I will leave you alone. She rose, and with the cloak around her shoulders to hide her modesty, she went to the corner and fetched a seax and a short sword. As she handed them to me, she said, You are a strange Viking. I smiled as I took the weapons. I married a Christian who was the daughter of a priest. I kill only those who try to kill me. When I emerged, I saw that the sun was beginning to rise in the east. There were three dead Saxons. Lodvia looked up and I said, I have the weapons of this one and they are within. He nodded. I am not sure that King Swain would approve, but I cannot find fault with you. 
We had done what was asked of us, and we stood to watch until Fire Drake edged around the headland. We now had our camp, and it looked to me to be a perfect place for the fleet to wait. As the sun had illuminated the valley, I saw that the twist in the mouth of the river meant that we could anchor the entire fleet and they would be hidden from the main channel by the fishing boats. The plan had nearly gone awry, but Lodvir and Benny were both good leaders. All was well. Chapter 4 Carl allowed us to rest while he and the other warriors secured the northeast corner of the island before taking all that there was from the island. There were no burrs and no great churches, but Carl ensured that there would be no warriors there to make our life difficult. We needed a secure base. Men were slain, and every man, woman, and child were brought to the river where they could be watched. As soon as the island had been cleared of all threats, we prepared to raid. Twenty Hedavir men were left to guard the Drekka and the captives. The ship's boys and the captains would also guard the ships we were leaving. We had been forced to kill just a few from the village, and the fisherfolk appeared grateful. We left half of the ships at anchor and double-crewed the rest to row to the river Hamble, which led into the heartland of Hamptonskir. We left before dawn, and Carl timed it perfectly so that we were rowing up the river just as dawn broke. We had light to see and surprised all of those along the river. We rowed three miles before we heard the bells tolling their warning. The river was still wide enough for us to land ships on both banks, and we quickly moored and landed. Our two Drekka were left under the command of Griotard, a few older warriors, and the ship's boys. We landed on the steerboard bank, and Jarl Swain, for the first time, led the men of Riba and Eirhorn on a raid. There were more than two hundred and fifty of us who poured across the land. Keeping Lodvia's men with us, the other captains each led their crews to attack the isolated farms and small villages. We headed for the sound of the tolling bell. The crude map we had looked at suggested there was a small town or large village, too small to be a burr, and it lay to the north and east of us. We ran towards it. This time my foster father led, and as his hearthweru, we dogged his steps. We heard cries from ahead and saw armed men hurrying to meet us. Numbers were hard to assess, but it made no difference in any case. Whomsoever we met, we fought. Wedge! As we kept moving towards the Saxons who were improvising a shield wall, we formed our wedge. This time there was neither Lodvia nor Griotard, and the new men would have to work out what to do, for we had not trained them for this. Without even pausing to ensure that he had enough men behind him, Jarl Swain levelled his spear and we ran at the Saxons. Hawk held his spear above his father's head and mine was to the side. I saw now that there were thirty-odd men in the wall. They had shields, but poorly made ones, and their spears were not as long as ours. Light glistened from helmets pitted with rust. The year we had not raided had made the men of Wessex careless. The Jarl increased his pace and we kept up with him. As he drew his spear back, so did I. Hawk would keep his where it was. A few stones and arrows were thrown at us. An arrow struck the mail on my right shoulder, but it did not even penetrate the mail. A stone pinged from the helmet of the Jarl and then my foster father and I struck together. Our spearheads were aimed at the faces peering from behind the worst shields I had ever seen. A short spearhead came towards my eye, but by turning my head, the metal merely scraped along the side of my helmet. I heard a cry as Saxon Slayer tore into the cheek and eye socket of a Saxon, and then the sheer weight of our charge bowled over the four men before us. We stamped on their heads as we crossed over them, and then we were through their line. As the wedge struck them, then more men were speared and stabbed. The ones at the side and rear of the crude shield wall broke and ran. I could see, as did the Jarl, that the defence had been to slow us so that their families could escape. The Saxons were wise enough not to carry too much away with them. Their lives were the most important thing. They would run towards the nearest place with a good wall. Hamwick was the nearest burr of any size, and that was some miles away. 
As we reached the edge of the town, we saw the last of the families in the distance. There was little to be gained from chasing them, as their speed meant that they carried nothing with them, and calling a halt we turned to begin to take all that we could from the town. While others searched the churches and the houses, often digging in their floors for buried chests, Jarl Swain questioned the prisoners. They were all wounded, and all but one looked unlikely to survive. He had me question the priest who had been stabbed in the leg. He would be crippled, but he would live. What is your name, priest? I had learned that by asking questions that appeared harmless you could often be led to nuggets of gold. John of Kerbridge. He winced as he spoke, and I took my ale skin and offered him a drink. He shook his head and I drank. When I offered it again, he accepted. And this is Kerbridge? He nodded. Do not worry, your people will make Hamwick, for that is where they have gone, is it not? It is, and Erladman Ethelweird, who waits there, is also the king's reeve. You will all die. I nodded. All men die? And if the king's reeve is close by, then so will Ethelred. Of course, for he would not desert his children in Etheling Valley. He realised he had said too much and shook his head. No more. Jarl Swain had understood most of what had been said, but I explained the priest's reaction. Etheling Valley suggests that the king's children are close. This cannot be the valley. We should send out scouts north to find it. Jarl Swain was quick thinking. Take my son, Alf, Leif, and Lars. Head north and see what you can find. We will use this as a base to raid. Be quick, foster son. I, Jarl, and I am honoured that you trust me. There is none I trust more. We ran along the road which led north and east. The river, whilst not navigable, also went in that direction, and I wondered if we were already in Ethling's Valley. I hung my helmet from Saxon Slayer so that I could both see and hear better. I was not worried about an attack. The road twisted and turned until it eventually rejoined the river at a small abandoned farm. We stopped to drink from our skins and take whatever food we could find while I got my bearings. We will leave the road and head along the riverbank, for that way we will be hidden. We make better time on the road, Sven. And we can be seen. If the children of the king are close, we do not wish them frightened into flight. If we take those as hostages, then think of the ransom we could demand. This is about cunning. When we left, I took a hunter's trail along the river, and within half a mile I was rewarded. There, just ahead of us, was a large town. This one did have a wall, but it was not made of stone, and there was no ditch. More importantly, there was a huge church and what looked like a large hall. I turned. We will head back. We have what we need. If this is not the valley the priests spoke of, it is still a good target. It was as we headed back that we came upon two Saxon warriors. We saw them because they were close to the road and obviously keeping watch for the likes of us. They would have information— and using Saxon Slayer, I signalled for Lars and Leif to go to my left. Hawk followed me to the right. We were within twenty paces before they saw us, and they ran. All the training I had done running to the wood and back when I was a youth had made me a fast runner. The male did not bother me, and I began to catch the one Hawk and I followed. When I was just five paces from him, I pulled back my arm and threw Saxon Slayer halved first. It smacked him on the back of the head and he fell face forward into a tree. When we reached him, I saw that he was not dead, but was unconscious. Lars and Leif arrived. Sorry, Sven. We do not have your skill. We were forced to kill our Saxon. No matter, we have a prisoner. Bind him and hang him from your spears. We will take him back so that we can question him. Food was being cooked when we arrived. The priest was hanging by his arms from a tree as Lodvia tried to get more information from him. I told the Jarl of our discovery and he used water to rouse the young Saxon warrior. When he opened his eyes I saw the terror in them as he saw that he was surrounded by fierce mailed warriors. The place with the wall and the church, 
It is Ethelings Valley. Shaking his head, he said, No, it is Bishop's Waltham, and the bishop has a home there. Where are the Ethelings? He shook his head and was so scared that he began to wet himself. Answer me truly, and you will not die, I promise. I know not, except that they are guarded by men of the king's bodyguard and kept in great halls to the north and east of here. Then this is the valley. Aye, it is. I turned to Jarl Swain. That is all he knows, of that I am certain. You have done well. Bind him, Alf. As the youth was taken away and the priest lowered to the ground, for we could get no more information, Jarl Swain said, And how far is this place called Bishop's Waltham? No more than two miles. Then I will have Lodvia when he has eaten take two crews and cut it off. On the morrow we take this treasure house. The four of us, the Jarl and his Hathweru, sat and ate together. As usual, Hawk was his buoyant, optimistic self. I liked that quality, for it was the best of my cousin. If all goes like this, then we can return home within a month. I looked at Swain One-Eye, who rolled his single orb. I continued to eat and waited for my foster-father to speak. He waited until his mouth was empty, and then said, My son, it is good that you see every horn of ale as half full. One eye mumbled, Over full if you ask me. Ignoring his firstborn, the Jarl went on. Carl Threefinkers has planned well. Our appearance at the Isle of Sheep and our disappearance means that the Saxons know not where we are. We have burst into their heartland and taken them by surprise. The Saxons are slow to rouse, but they have a system. Each burr, town and village will now be ordered to supply warriors. They will be told to assemble, and then, when they do, they will come to meet us in battle. The Saxons like the idea of hundreds, and that is how they will be formed. There will be many bands of one hundred, and they will gather together. If we face them one by one, then you are quite right, Alf, son of Swain. We would be able to destroy them, and we might be home sooner rather than later. That is not the way it will be, and by threatening the children of the king, we draw an army to us. It was a patient explanation. I realised that I had known what my foster father would say before he did. There were no surprises in his words. The only surprise for me was that we were threatening the king's children. We did not need to take them. In fact, that was an unlikely occurrence, but by threatening them we would draw them into battle. Tomorrow we attack a town with a wall. From what Sven says there is no ditch, and the wall is not high, but they will defend it. Now that I am a Jarl, I have to lead, and that means we shall be first over the wall. Others will place their shields so that the four of us can spring over the top. He smiled. We shall see Alf the Swooping Hawk once more, eh? Before I lay down to sleep, I took out the whetstone and sharpened Saxon Slayer and Oath Sword. The virtue of a sharpened spear had been shown when a prick had made the fisherman acquiesce to my request. That done, I said a silent prayer to the Allfather to watch over my wife and unborn child and then lay down at the feet of the Jarl. To get to our leader, the three of us would have to be crossed. We did not take all the men of Ribe and Eyrhon. Men were sent to find Karl Three Fingers, while others took our treasures back to the Drekker, and twenty men guarded the settlement. It meant we had just over one hundred and forty men with us as we headed along the road and the river. Our killing of the guards would have warned the people of Bishop's Waltham that Vikings were abroad and they would be ready. I hoped that they had watched on their walls all night and would be weary. When we saw the walls, another twenty men were sent to join Lodvir. His task was just to hold the road north. As Swain Skulltaker had explained, the Saxon army was slow to muster, and we had a short time to take all that we could before a large army could be gathered to face us. One advantage we always had was that we did not need a long time to prepare for battle. 
Even as we were marching north, the captains and leaders were already instructing their men what to do. Saxons liked to be blessed by their priests and to have their sins absolved. They liked to sing hymns so that their God was with them. We needed none of that, and as soon as we reached the wall, Jarl Swain Skulltaker ordered Hawk to sound the war horn three times, and we simply began our attack. Leif, Lars, Dreng, Edel, and the other experienced warriors, using their shields held above them, raced ahead to the wall and then stood in pairs with their backs to the wall holding a shield between them. The four of us ran towards them. The same thing was being repeated all along this southern wall of Bishop's Waltham. Arrows and stones were sent at us and we had no shield to protect us. We had them over our backs. What we did have was speed and surprise. Our multiple attacks on the walls had divided the Saxon attack. Some sent arrows and stones at us, while others tried to hit the moving mailed men who did not run in an obligingly straight line but jinked from side to side. I ran to Lars and Leif. I had fought alongside them since my first battle and I trusted them completely. I planted my right leg on the shield and even as I placed my left on the wooden boards I was lifted swiftly into the air. I felt as Hawk must have done on the Norse Drekker. It seemed to me that I was flying. I had Saxon Slayer's head pointing down as I descended to the fighting platform. A Saxon looked up as the broad head of Saxon Slayer drove down into his shoulder. As he fell backwards, his body broke my fall, which was a softer landing than I might have expected. Withdrawing my spearhead, I rammed it into the side of a second Saxon who turned to face me. The others landed and I saw that we had cleared a patch of the wall ten paces long. Sven, Hawk, help the others to ascend the wall. The Jarl and his elder son stood to protect us as I lowered Saxon Slayer over the wall. Lars grabbed it, and as he climbed I leaned backwards to counterbalance him. Once he and his brother joined us, then we could begin to clear the walls. Dreng and Edel followed quickly, and when Galmer and Falmer joined us, we had enough. Half of our men waited by the gate, and Swain One Eye led us that way. I was to his right, and Hawk followed. I had pulled my shield around once we had made the platform, and its edge gave some protection to Swain One Eye's spear hand. Saxons faced us. I saw no burnies, but the metal studded leather and hide would afford some protection. They ran at us, intending to sweep us from the walls. One Eye and I stabbed together with our spears. The Saxon spears came back at us, but ours were longer, and we thrust faster and with more power. The result was that the Saxons flicked up their shields and did not follow their spear thrusts with their eyes. We did. It had cost Swain his eye, and now his helmet had a mask. My spear went into the thigh of the Saxon who was closest to the edge of the fighting platform. It was a narrow one, and as Saxon Slayer grated off the man's thigh bone, I twisted. The head of the spear was a large one and it tore a hole in his leg. Screaming, he lost his balance and toppled to the town below. Swain One Eye had been even more accurate and his spear had driven into the right shoulder of the Saxon he faced. As the blood spurted, Swain swung his shield to smash into the side of the Saxon's head and the man fell before me and into the town like his comrade. Before the others could gather their wits we both stabbed so quickly that the warriors failed to bring their shields around quickly enough. A spearhead in the guts of a comrade makes a man think twice about standing, and the Saxons who faced us turned and ran. We ran too, and it was a foot race along the wooden fighting platform. They were running for their lives and not wearing mail. They won the race, but instead of defending the gate they kept running back into the heart of Bishop's Waltham and the church. We descended from the walls. Leif, Lars, open the gate. The four of us stood to face the town as the brothers descended the steps to unbar the gate and allow in the rest of the warband. Drang Eberson, Edel, open the north gate for Lodvir. The rest of you, form a wedge. The two warriors ran to the other side of the gate and descended the fighting platform. They would fight their way to the north gate and our reserves who waited there. This would be an improvised formation. 
Leif and Lars would not be behind me, but we had used it enough times for even the new warriors like Faramir and Snorri to know where to stand, and against townsfolk it would suffice. Folky Drengsen's voice came from behind us. We are ready, Jarl Swain. With such a mix of men behind us, Swain one eye began a chant just to keep the beat and to put heart into the new warriors. Our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. We are the bird ye cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if ye can, my friend. Our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. It was hypnotic, and I had a clear view of the Saxons before us as we moved slowly towards them. Knots of men stood with spears and shields, but as our boots all stamped together and the last words were shouted out to strike like arrowheads, they turned and fled. They did not halt until they reached the church where two priests held aloft crosses and implored God to strike down the barbarians. The Saxons we had chased tried to join the shield wall, but all they did was to disorder it. We did not stop, but ran into them. Spears and mail are an irresistible combination. They had their faith to hold on to, but that does not stop a broad-headed spear. The ones who stood were massacred, and the rest simply fled. Many escaped by climbing the walls and dropping over the side to flee the town. They then ran as far away from Bishop's Waltham as they could get. Their fear saved many lives. When we piled the bodies before the church, we found that less than thirty Saxons had been killed. Many more might have been wounded, but they had escaped. We had lost just one man, and his death had been avoidable. Running along the fighting platform, he had slipped and broken his neck when he landed. Weird. We had found a palace. The Bishop of Winchester was a rich man, and the town was both large and prosperous. We estimated that five hundred or more people had lived there. We found a huge amount of treasure, and this time we found both wagons and horses. We began to ferry what we had found back to the ships. It was the next day when Carl Three Fingers and the rest of the army found us. They too had been successful, and men were already taking what we had found back to the ships. As Hearthwiru, we were there when Carl called a council of war. Our scouts report that the Saxons have raised the feared and the local levy are gathered to the north of us. We now have the chance to defeat them in battle, and then we can raid this land unopposed. The Arl Swain Skulltaker was Carl's lieutenant, and I saw that he did not like that idea. Carl, we have not lost many men in battle, but half of our force is either taking goods back to the Drecker or guarding them. We have less than five hundred men to face the Saxon army. Swain, this is not the king's army we will be fighting, but the men of Hamptonskir. What can beat them? Swain nodded. In normal circumstances I would agree, but this is the Ethelings Valley. They protect the king's children. That will inspire men, will it not? Then we need to make them angry, so that they fall upon our spears. We will burn the town before we leave and march north. Let us use their passion to destroy them. That was the moment I realised that Swain Skulltaker was a better general than Carl Threefingers. The die was cast, and the Norns had spun. When all had been taken and with full bellies, we left before dawn with a sky filled not with sunrise but the flames of the fire which devoured Bishop's Waltham. The Saxons awaited us at a place we later learned was called Dean. There were more than fifteen hundred men of the Saxon fear, and they outnumbered us by three to one. Nor did we have the number we expected. One warband led by Gudrun the Greedy neither arrived at Bishop's Waltham nor did they arrive at Dean. Carl Threefingers was angry that forty-eight men were missing and that a hairseer had led his men off on a separate raid. We had to face our foe with what we had. The Saxons formed a shield wall. The bulk of their warriors were without mail. 
Their thanes and housecarls were clearly identified by their mail, helmets, and, in many cases, their two-handed war axes. They looked to me to be the stiffening of the line. They were like the pieces of metal I had hammered upon my shield. They minimised the damage I might take, and for the Saxons were rocks of strength amongst the shifting sands of the bulk of their men. Swain Skulltaker, I would have the men of Ribba and Eirhanna on my right. Jarl Harald of Trelleborg will command the left. We'll let them blunt their anger on our spears, and when their housecarls and thanes lie bleeding, then we will advance and we will take the field. When the words dripped from Karl's tongue, they sounded as with all plans like perfection. The reality is that the Norns, the battlefield, or men, will change the outcome. It never works out the way it is planned, but we could find no fault with it, and so the mailed men of Ribe and Eirhon formed the front line of the shield wall. The second line had a sprinkling of mail, while the third was composed entirely of the unmailed warriors. Faramir, Snorri, and the new ones were there. They had their bows and their slings. They would use those until spears were needed, but I knew that if they had to fight with spears, then we had lost the battle. Hawk was happy, for he was now in the front rank. He constantly badgered his brother and me to let him flank his father. He planted his father's standard between him and his brother. On my right I had the brothers Lars and Leif. Five warriors down stood Lodvir, and I knew that our section of the line was the strongest. We watched and listened as the Bishop of Winchester exhorted the Christians to slaughter us and avenge the dead of Bishop Swaltham. It was his treasure he wanted back, and that was now safely on our Drekka moored and guarded in the Hamble. When his words had lit fires in their hearts, with spears banging on shields they advanced. Swain won I chose that moment to sing a song himself as the Saxons crossed the thousand paces to our front line. It was my song, the song of Oathsword. When the clan of Eirhorn assailed the Somme, when the warriors fierce were to Francia come, when Sea Serpent bared her bloody teeth, her crew were filled with blood-filled belief. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath, bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath, bright and new. Skulltaker went to find monk's gold, hidden in a church made of stone and old. The Franks could not face his bloody blade, all who came near were quickly slayed. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. Sven Saxon's sword fought like a bear. Three men were killed in the farmhouse there. Then a jagged spear broke his skin, bearing the bones and all within. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. As the ship sailed home, a trap was laid, but the Eirhan clan were not afraid. They rowed and worked as a single man, determined to thwart the Frankish plan. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The Njorther played a cruel joke. The tide was turned and their hearts were broke. Then as Frankish ships loomed at their side, a hero rose the battle to decide. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. Sorely hurt with sword in hand, Sven Saxon's sword saved the band. He hacked and slashed at Frankish skin, fueled by the power which lay within. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. When Thorstein rammed the enemy boat, and Sea Serpent remained afloat, Njörða smiled and the clan had won, saved by Sven, brave Bersi's son. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. The sword of the Saxons is strong and true, with a dragon sheath bright and new. 
By the time the Saxons were in the range of our bows and slings and had halted to send their missiles at us, we had finished the song, and men banged their shields to drown out the Saxon shouts. We had raised our shields to bang upon them, and they stopped the worst that the Saxon arrows and stones could do. It helped that our front ranks were mailed, and the odd arrow or stone which penetrated the wall of shields did little harm. As most of the Saxons had no mail, then ours did more damage and prompted a charge. Brace! Every mailed warrior had practised this. With the butt of our spears planted in the ground next to the right foot, which was slightly behind our left, we locked shields and leaned into them. I had shields pushing in my back, but I did not know the warriors, for they came from Reba. I would have to trust them. Their spears were not planted in the ground, but were held over our shoulders, as were those from the third rank. The Saxons ran, but they did not chant, and some fell. Others reached us before their comrades, but our section had the honour of a Saxon thane and his six housecarls to face. They had recognised the superior mail and armour, not to mention the standard of Jarl Swain's skulltaker, and they made for us. The housecarl who came at me held his axe in two hands. As he swung down at me I raised my shield, as did Lars and the Jarl. I knew that I would have to take the blow and that it would hurt. The two spears behind me jabbed out as the axe struck my shield. Odin smiled on me, for the head hit the boss of my shield. It dented it and it numbed my left arm, but the axe head would be slightly blunted and my shield had done its job. My right hand jabbed forward, and Saxon Slayer slid through male links to score a wound in his side. His face, close to mine, showed the pain, and I lifted the spear to ram it again before he could react. Even as he was raising his axe a second time, Saxon Slayer tore through male links and buried itself in flesh. This time it was his chest that was struck. Leaving the spearhead in his body, I drew Norse gutter and as the housecarl lifted his axe head, I drove my dagger into his jaw and up through his skull. I saw the life leave his body, and slipping Norse gutter into my left hand grabbed hold of Saxon Slayer once more. The falling body freed my spear. The one I had killed was the only dead Saxon that I could see, and the sounds which filled my head were those of a weaponsmith and his workshop as mailed men exchanged blows. The second man who stepped into the gap vacated by the dead house carl whose body lay between us was wary, and holding his shield defensively prodded and poked with his shorter spear. I blocked his blows easily, and when my right hand suddenly darted out I managed to drive it through his cheek. He turned and with blood pouring from the wound forced his way back through the other ranks. Swain Skulltaker shouted, Reba and Ayahon, forward! He had seen the gap created by the dead Saxon, the one who had fled, and the ones reluctant to face me. As one, every warrior either stabbed with his spear or swung his sword. The two spears behind me were able to strike the Saxons fighting Lars and the Jarl. One slid to the ground as a spear entered his skull, and the other reeled backwards. It meant we had an improvised wedge with me at the fore. I had the advantage that I was fighting men without mail and shorter spears. They fell back, and soon our whole wing was marching forward. I thought that we had won the battle until Carl Threefingers roared, Reba! Halt! Swain Skulltaker repeated the order, and we stopped, watching the Saxons fall back in good order until they were one hundred paces away. I turned to my foster father. We had them! He shook his head, for he could see what I could not, and he pointed to his left. Our line was now echeloned back, and our left wing had collapsed. There was a line of Danish bodies, some of them mailed, and they lay ahead of our starting position. The plan had been a good one, but the execution was flawed. Carl was right, and had we continued them we would have been surrounded and cut off. We stood until the sun had passed its zenith. Carl called a council of war. Stay here. He called out. Lodvia, take command. I took out my ale skin and drank as Lodvia walked towards us. 
That is why I hate fighting with other clans. I know the quality of our men, but others... He grinned at me and pointed back to the mailed man I had killed in the first attack. A house carl, and he has good mail. Shaking my head, I said, Not good enough, for Saxon Slayer pierced it twice. Still, I will take it back, and his axe. It might be useful for hewing trees. Ramming Saxon Slayer in the ground and leaning my shield against it, I went back to the body. Faramir raced forward to help me remove the mail burnie and helmet. Here, the helmet is yours. I handed it to the young warrior and I searched the body. I found a purse and a silver cross which I also took. I laid the axe on the burnie and then took the house carl's say axe and sword. The sword was a good one, but I had two better. Take these and give them to whoever needs them. But they are yours, Sven Saxon sword. You took them. And before we reach Eirhorn, I would hope to take more. I would rather the new warriors had a fighting chance of seeing our home again. Take them. We left the field just before dark. We burned our bodies. We had lost eighty-six men, mainly Jarl Harald of Trelleborg and his men who had disobeyed orders and attacked prematurely. They had paid with their lives. Worse news was to come. Three miles from the battle we came upon the missing warband. Gudrum the Greedy and his men had been ambushed. Their naked and mutilated bodies showed the dangers of becoming isolated when raiding. It made up Karl's mind. As we reached our ships on the Hamble, he said, Tomorrow we'll return to White, where we'll talk when we are there. Chapter 5 Thorsten and Griotard had already packed our treasure below the decks. We had no thralls yet, but we had gold, religious artefacts, weapons, and food. If we had sailed home, then we would have deemed it a successful raid. We did not have to row down the rivers to the sea, and as the wind was with us we made the Meduna easily. Jarl Swain told Thorsten of the battle, and we watched the land now illuminated by the fires of the burning dead. We were in a more sombre mood than we would have been before we had found the mutilated bodies. In a way it was a good thing for the younger warriors saw the price of failure. I walked to the prow to speak with them and to ensure that none had wounds. Even a small cut could fester and kill. I was relieved that they had not even come close to suffering wounds. Thank you for the weapons, Saxon sword. We are grateful. I nodded at Snorri, who, as one of the better swordsmen, had been given the housecarl's sword. You will learn that until you attain your full plumage and have a burnie and good helmet, you must be as a magpie or raven. Strip the dead when you can. Coins are useful back in Reba, but until we get there, then a sword, shield, helmet, and mail shirt are of more use. Will we go home now, Sven Saxon sword, for we have taken treasure? Not enough to satisfy the king, and Karl Three Fingers will not like to leave with the bitter taste of a battle he did not win and butchered warriors. We will raid, and now that you have been blooded, then you have more chance of survival. Gandalfer shook his head. When I saw the axe come down, Sven Saxon sword, I thought you were a dead man. I nodded towards the shields along the side. It took me a long time to make my shield. Lodvir and Griotard gave good advice. When we have the chance, I will beat out the dent in the boss, but the time I spent was worth it, was it not? They all nodded. Instead of throwing dice, the next time we are in camp, See how you can improve your shield. Odd pieces of metal hammered onto the cover will add protection. The skins of dead animals will help soften the blow. Using seal oil or pine tar on the wood will also help. A male burnie is useful, but, as the house carl found, a shield would have been better. We returned to the Meduna and cooked the food we had taken. Carl decided to leave our next council of war until the morning, and that was probably a wise decision as the dawn would bring the sun from the east and hope. 
I put my treasures in my chest before sharpening my weapons. The burney was valuable, not as mail, but as metal. I did not think there was an immediate chance of needing my spear, sword, and dagger, but if they were dull, then I could guarantee that I would need them. I also took the opportunity of putting dry sand in a sack to clean my burney. I shook it vigorously, and then left it. We would not be leaving, if indeed we were leaving, before noon. The captains and jarls were summoned to fire Drake first thing to be given their instructions by Carl Threefingers. The majority of the crews were sent to shift cargo around. There were some ships with almost empty holds. All were distributed evenly. Of course, the treasures I had taken would remain in my chest. That was true of every warrior. I wondered what would happen to Guthrum the Greedy's ship, Ice Maiden. She would either need to be burned or to be crewed. She had remained on the Meduna, but there were just her sailing master and ship's boys left from her crew. I had managed to not only finish cleaning my burney, but also putting the housecarl's one in the sack by the time Jarl Swain returned. Clean metal was of more use than bloodied. My foster father and Lodvir joined us at the fire. We had relieved the Bishop of Winchester of a few barrels of wine, and we broached one as we ate one of the pigs taken from his larder. We sail west. Lodvir smiled at me as Jarl Swain's statement sank in. Back to the fall and your sword, Sven. The Norns, it seems, have not finished with you. I clutched my hammer of Thor, and I never said that they had. Lodvir laughed, for we knew it did not do to disparage or to disregard the three sisters. Is there treasure there, father? Hawk had thought we would go home, and now he knew we would be away for much longer. The Jarl nodded. The land we raid next has been attacked more times than the place they call Denshire. Even if we take little, it matters not, for we are already rich. We took no thralls here and I know that my foster son seeks those to work in his fields. It would seem to me that this land far to the west is a better hunting ground, and besides, the dead we left in the Aethling's valley seem to me a sign that this is not the place to raid. Hawk said, We could have won. When you ordered us forward, then those at the rear of the men we fought began to flee. And had everyone done as they were ordered, then you are right. Lodvia will tell you, my son, but such battles are rare. Some warriors will choose that moment for the chance of glory, or some hair-seer will see a chance to make a name for his clan. We did not lose, and I will take that. I waved a pig-bone I was gnawing at the houses at the mouth of the Meduna. And these people? Will keep their homes and lives. I finished off the sentence, but lose their ships. Swain Skulltaker nodded. Aye because we do not wish those on the mainland to know where we sail, and we cannot keep that too much of a secret. The longer the Saxons remain in doubt, then the greater our chance of success. It is a sad fact of life, Sven. I can see that Mary has had an influence on you, for you have a softer streak in you now. There was veiled criticism in his voice, and I nodded. The sea changes the land where it touches. I cannot go back to a time where my wife was not in my life, nor would I wish to. She is bound up with me just as much as Oathsword. The Norns have spun, Foster Father, and I can do nothing about my circumstance. I know, and those who are so chosen are to be pitied, for they have little choice in the paths that they follow. There was wailing and cries as we destroyed and burned the ships of the fishermen. There was wood enough to build new ones, and the estuary lent itself to nets. But a man does not like to see his livelihood ruined, and as we sailed from the river I knew that we had made enemies. The wind and the currents meant we sailed to the west when we left the river. That could not be helped. But Carl then took us due south until we were away from land. Once the Isle of Wight disappeared we headed west once more. Sluggish winds from the wrong direction meant that we were forced to row. I knew that the sailing master of Ice Maiden would be glad of the chance to have his new crew, culled from other Heatherby ships, all learn to pull together. 
We had lost men, but not ships, and we kept the same formation. Two days from White, we endured a savage storm which found us spread across the western seas to the south of Silingar. This was wild water, and the walls into which we smashed were higher than the masts of our ships. We plunged into troughs and climbed cliffs. There was no order to the fleet, and every ship looked to itself. When the storm eased and the sun rose, we looked around and saw Dreka scattered across the ocean. It took another two days to recover every ship and reform. We found that the Snecker, Adder, had disappeared. We found some wreckage, and that was all. I was sad, for I had liked her young captain, Benny. Two more ships were so badly damaged that they needed to be towed. The storm meant that the ships of Ribba and Eigerhon became the point of our seaborne wedge, and we headed north to the coast of Denshire and the River X. Carl had decided that we would not try the fall, but virgin land we had yet to raid. The coastline was a rugged one, but the Saxon strongholds appeared to be inland along the rivers. We beached close to the mouth of the X. There was a settlement on the far side of the river, and so we landed on the sands to the west. Once Carl Three Fingers landed, he gave us the task of taking and destroying the settlement, while he and ten ships headed up the X to raid the Burr of Exeter. Our men were unhappy at the task, as the twelve houses of what we later learned was called Ludwig Knesse would yield little treasure. Our Jarl showed his teeth and threatened to leave behind any who questioned our orders. In all the time we spent away from Ayyarana, it was the only time he had to speak thus, and it worked. We crossed the river before dawn and took the houses without loss, for the people had fled. They had left their animals, and after burning their homes we returned to our new camp with animals we would keep to take back to our home. Mindful that this was not an island, the Jarl, now in command, had a ditch dug and stakes placed on the landward side. He was being cautious. With Carl and his ships in the north we raided the land to the west and the south. It was profitable, and all were taken by surprise, for they had no towers along the coast. The first they knew of our presence was when two or three ships' crews descended upon them from the landward side in the early hours. This time we took thralls, and they were secured, wailing and crying, in our new camp. We could almost have done this without drawn weapons, for the sight of mailed Vikings inspired terror, and few faced us with weapons. The ones that did were quickly eliminated. Carl and his ships returned three days later, and it was with empty chests and the air of defeat hanging heavily upon them. It was clear to all what had happened, and as wounded were fetched ashore to be tended, Carl Three Fingers met with Jarl Svein. We and Carl's Hearthweru formed a protective barrier so that they could speak privately. We were a mailed human wall. Their burrs are too strong for us, or else I am not the man to take them. I had never heard Carl Three Fingers sound so low. Did we lose many men? As many as we did at Dean. The men showed courage and obeyed orders, but they had strong walls around Exeter and stake-lined ditches, what did not have enough archers nor any war machines. And would the target have been worth it? The target? Exeter. There were churches, and the size of the place suggested it was rich. Why? I knew that Swain was pointing without turning. We have not lost a man, and yet we have taken thirty slaves, sheep, cattle, and treasure from three churches. All of that was within a day of here. If we move a little further afield, then who knows what we might find. You were right to come here, Carl Three Fingers, for it is a rich land. But I wonder at the wisdom of attacking walls. Do we wish to rule their towns, or do we want to make coin and take treasure? I heard Carl laugh. Wisdom drips from your tongue like honey from a hive. You are right. I will need a day for my men to recover. Tomorrow, take your ships down to the river Tain, 
for what took a prisoner who told us that it is a prosperous part of Wessex, with the added advantage that you can sail close to the best land. We will return up the X and raid the land around the Boer, but for now, let the Saxons think they have defeated us. I know that the chance to sail with just the men of Reba and Ayrhana suited the Jarl, for if anything went wrong then he knew who to blame. Himself. We left nothing to chance, and we emptied our holds so that we would be able to travel further up a river whose depth we did not know. We stepped the mast and relied on oars. It also meant that we would be hard to see. We left in the middle of the night and sailed the few miles down the coast to the narrow mouth of the Tain. It was a risk navigating at night, but Thorsten the Lucky was well named, and once we were through then the river widened to, as we discovered later, almost six hundred paces wide. We sailed up the middle in darkness. Dawn was not far off when, after rowing for more than three miles, the lookouts reported that the river narrowed dramatically. I believe we could still have navigated a little further, but as we clambered ashore and smelled the wood smoke, we knew that we were close to settlements. We had come far enough. The Jarl sent out four pairs of men to try to find places for us to raid while he organised the rest into three bands. We left twenty men to guard the ships, and by the time the first of the scouts had returned the sun was up and we were ready to move. Siggy Longsight was the first back. He and his brother Harold were our best scouts. There is a good-sized town just a mile away. It is not a burr, and we smell churches. It was a simple report, and it told us all that we needed to know. Leaving Ragnar Redhair with the third group to take on any settlements the other scouts found, the Jarl and Lodvia led the two largest warbands towards the town we later learned was called Tainton. Even as we neared it, we could see that it was bigger and richer than Bishop's Waltham. There were no walls, but we passed through a deer park which showed that nobles and royalty hunted here. Waving his spear to signal Lodvia to head east, we followed the river and headed west. We knew it was only a matter of time before we were seen, but we were within two hundred paces before the inevitable shout rent the air. Vikings! With the rest of our men, all fifty of them behind us, we descended like a plague on the town which was just waking up. There had been a town watch, and it was they who gave the alarm. The four Saxons who ran at us were brave, but deluded. They could not even begin to slow us up, let alone stop us, and their bodies marked the first Saxon deaths. There were, in truth, not that many. That was down to the planning of the Jarl. We had struck them at dawn, and with no walls for protection, then they were doomed. By noon we had secured the whole town and had the time to select the best thralls and to use the town's own shackles to secure them. The river was too narrow for a drecker, and so we used the townsfolk, even those we had not enslaved, to carry all their goods back to our ships. As a royal town it was rich, and our holds were filled with valuables richer than any I had seen thus far on the raids. We burned the town before we headed back, the next day, to our ships. By then Ragnar Redhair had found other settlements which yielded slaves and riches. Exeter, it seemed, was the only place that was strong enough to defy us. We raided for a week before heading back to our camp on the X. We left behind burned towns that had people mourning their lost homes, but no animals. It would be a hard winter in this part of the land. We left for the X, even though there appeared to be little threat to us. As Swain Skulltaker said, it would not take long for the Saxons to raise an army to oppose us, and we did not wish a repeat of the Battle of Dean. Carl Threefingers had not been idle, and he had built a second fortified camp on the other side of the river where we had destroyed the first settlement. It had enabled him to raid the eastern side of the axe. We used the first camp we had made, but then took a captured Saxon fishing boat to visit with Carl. Our holds are full, Carl, and we could return home. Shaking his head, Carl said, The harvest is just being collected. 
we will wait until then to go back. But we have no room for it. Carl gave a sad smile. I was given quite specific orders by King Swain. He wishes to punish the Saxons for their failure to send tribute last year. As we had been busy in our own war, the king had not demanded it, but I could see a method in King Swain's plan. If we hurt them badly enough, then they would send money just to keep their crops safe. You and your men have done enough. Guard our camp and hunt. We will raid. And so we had the strangest month I had yet spent as a raider. We wore no mail, and we hunted their deer and wild pigs. We caught fish and we ate well. The only raiding we did was just to take ale and the fermented apple juice. None of that even needed a sword. Oath Sword had slept in its scabbard for almost the whole time we had spent in this part of the world. The enforced idleness just made me pine even more for Mary. We were not needed here, and I could be at home awaiting the birth of my child. I began to think of the words I would say to my wife and child when I returned home. Some of the men had lain with the slaves we would take back, and when he discovered this, Jarl Swain Skulltaker became as angry as I had ever seen him. These slaves belong to all of us who raided. If you have planted your seed in them, then they are not as useful as if they were whole. All the men who have lain with slaves shall be given less treasure. The value of the slaves will be taken from you a share. There were just twelve of the men who had done this, but as we only had thirty female slaves, then more than a third were at risk. A messenger came from Carl, and it proved that Swain Skulltaker had been proved right. An army had been gathered to drive us from their land, and we were ordered to march north towards Exeter, where Carl Three Fingers awaited us. The messenger gave us more information. All the captives were placed in one camp, and the Drekker all gathered together and guarded. With ships and slaves secure, we led two hundred men north. Ethelred's High Reeve is a man called Kola. He has summoned a huge army, and Carl thinks that he has taken so long as he wishes to ensure that they will win. He has raised not just the men of Denshire, but those from the land further north where we raided a couple of years ago. I remembered that fight, and knew that this might be a harder battle, for they had fought well the last time we had been here. Carl's camp was not at Exeter, but a couple of miles east. There was little danger of the men of Exeter sallying forth to join Kola, as Carl's raids had whittled down their numbers when they had tried to stop our privations. The Saxon army was still gathering across the flat ground which Carl had chosen. There was a stream close to the Saxon camp, and they had that at their back. When I went with Jarl Swain and Carl to view the Saxon position, I thought that was a mistake. The stream was shallow and not particularly wide, but if the Saxons had to fall back, then it would hinder them. I think that there will be more than two thousand of them when they all reach us, Swain. And we have less than five hundred now. We had been forced to leave more than a hundred and eighty men guarding the camp and the Drekker. Carl had to leave another fifty men to guard what he had taken. It struck me that my foster father had been right. We should have left when he suggested. Carl nodded. This time we we'll use two blocks of men. Dean was a lesson to me, Swain. You have the right flank. It is a wide open plain, and they will try to turn us by outflanking us with their superior numbers. I intend to use that. We allow the enemy to push back. When they think that we are in their jaws, then we strike. You and I, with our best men into their heart, we head for Kola, the High Reeve, and the priests. That is a risky plan. Aye, and had we tried it with the men we led at Dean, it might have failed, but the rotten wood has been shaved from the army, and the ones who remain now know that you and I are good leaders who bring rewards. They will obey. In that, he was right, although the men of Reba and Aigarona had always been dependable. It was ironic that the smaller army we now led was a better one than that which had fought at Dean. We kept a good watch that night, but as we heard men still arriving during the evening we knew that there would be no night attack, and the next morning we donned our war faces. 
Our clan did not go in for face painting and the like, but some of the men led by Carl did, and we saw warriors blackening or reddening their faces so that they would terrify the Saxons. We would just rely on our weapons and our resolve. It was strange, but so long as we followed the Jarl we were confident that we would win. As the Saxons arrayed and went through their normal ritual, so Carl and Swain explained to each Herseer and Drekker captain what was involved. Lodvir would be with us, and the men of Eirhorna would lead the right prong of the attack when Carl sprang his trap. Much depended upon the lightly armoured men on our flanks. Lodvir used his shield and spear for effect as he told the leaders what their men would have to do. Lock your shields and just poke with your spears. Our spears are longer and have metal heads. Some of the Saxons use narrow-headed spears or even spear-hardened ones. Let them push you back. Let them think that you are beaten. We stretch their numbers so thinly that it will be like an overinflated pig's bladder, and when it bursts, then we shall reap the reward. Lodvir, despite his position in Reba, was still Swain Skulltaker's lieutenant, and his wisdom gave confidence to the warband. Our formation must have encouraged the Saxons. We had a three-deep line, and the third line was composed of slingers and archers. When our flanks turned, they would be in the centre. The Saxons formed a huge, long line, three men deep. As at Dean, their front ranks were sprinkled with metal, but there were fewer of them. Once again it was noon by the time they had prayed to God to help them, and then they advanced. We just banged our shields as they advanced. We needed no chant, for we were not moving. The Saxon battle plan was clear, and they did as we expected. They used the flat fields to flank us. Carl shouted, No! It was not the command to advance, but for the second rank to echelon and angle themselves. It was like when we made a ship. The wetted wood was formed around a round object, gently so as not to break and to retain its strength. As the Saxons ran to surround us, so our lines matched theirs. The slingers and archers, a third of our army, did what the Saxons could not do. They rained death upon them. The Saxons were so numerous that the deaths did not appear to shake their faith in their god, Cola and Victory. It was their mailed men who first clashed with us. There were fewer axes this time, and for that I was grateful. I had beaten out the dent, but I knew that I would need a new boss. The captured Burney would give me the metal I needed when I returned home. We had no shields behind us, and we could not afford to be pushed back. We had to hold firm, and as the Saxon line collided with ours, Jarl Swain Skulltaker shouted, Thrust! With shield foot planted, we all stepped forward with our spear foot and rammed our spears at the Saxons. The Saxons did not train as long as we did, and they were ragged in comparison. More of our spears were bloody compared with the Saxons, and our step forward meant that we had not conceded even a hand span of ground. My spear had found flesh, the housecarl's leg, and when I used my helmet to butt him and then punch with the boss of my shield, the weakened warrior collapsed. Go to your god! Saxon Slayer drove down to pin him to the ground. It was a mistake, for even as I tried to withdraw my spear, a second Saxon thrust at me with his spear. I pulled my shield around as I drew oath sword. The spear struck my shield, but I barely felt the blow, for my shield had padding. I brought oath sword up under the spear, and the Saxon was so busy looking for the wound he had inflicted that he failed to see the sword. I felt it slide and scrape along his ribs. I turned the blade slightly, and the warrior screamed. Others had shouted and cried out, but the scream seemed to penetrate the battle noise. As I ripped out the blade, I shouted, Oath sword! The Saxon sword has struck! It was not just my shield brothers who were heartened by the cry, but all those who faced the Saxon mail. There was a collective cry of, Oath sword! It seemed to act as a spur. Perhaps it was the sword, or the thought of the dragon sword, which gave extra power to our weapons, but as I brought it down to smash into the shoulder of another Saxon, it seemed that the enemy line took a step back, and there was suddenly a pile of bodies before us. 
Jarl Svein Skulltaker stepped forward, and that took our line across the bodies. I could now see that the Saxon line was much thinner, and, more importantly, I could see Kola and the priests. Kola was surrounded by his bodyguard and mounted on a pony so that he could better view the battle. It was then that Karl shouted, Forward! And his hearth weru sounded the horn. It was the signal for every warrior to thrust forward. The slingers and bowmen sent one more missile and then dropping their bows and slings picked up shields and sharpened unused spears. We did not run for that risk to fall. There were bodies littering the ground. Instead we stepped forward as one. Others still had their spears out, but one eye, Lars and Lodvir close by me also had swords. In a shield wall, there is no better weapon than a spear, but when you are alone and not locked with shield brothers, then it is a liability. The Saxon spears had no edge, and their wood was not protected with metal. As the Saxon thrust his spear at me, I deflected it with my shield, and then, angling my sword, sliced across it to sever the weapon in two. I continued the stroke, and even though the Saxon managed to raise his shield, I knocked him backwards. He kept his feet and tried to draw his shorter sword, but I was on him, and oath swords smashed through his helmet and skull as though they were made of parchment. Some men broke, and I saw that we were just thirty paces from Kola and the priests. A moment or two earlier they had seen their army surround ours, and now, within a few strokes, they were under threat. With me! Jarl Swain Skulltaker was no berserker, but he recognised the moment to strike, and we ran. The pony Kola had chosen was not battle-hardened, and as he tried to turn it, it fell when it refused to obey him. The priests ran, and Kola's bodyguard formed a thin line around him. We did not pause. Hawk was the fastest, and he ducked beneath the swinging axe of a house carl to punch up with his shield and then to ram his spear into the neck and skull of the bodyguard. Swain One-Eye deflected the spear and gutted his opponent. Out of the corner of my eye I saw our Jarl swing his sword to take Kola's unprotected leg as a house carl's axe came at my head. I simply stepped forward and punched with my shield. It was not the axe head that struck me, but the wooden haft, and I was so close that I was able to drive oath sword into the neck and head of the bodyguard. Kola lay bleeding to death, and the priests ran. The Saxon command was gone, and the whole army fled. They still outnumbered us, but we were between them and their camp. They ran, and we followed. I saw that the younger warriors from Ayahana were still alive, and they pursued a broken enemy. As I had predicted, the stream proved their undoing. Whilst some Saxons simply leapt it, others, like the priests, either hesitated or began to wade. The Saxons were stopped by a wall of their own men, and they were butchered as they tried to escape the wall of metal which relentlessly pursued them. We did not stop until we reached the rich manors of Pinho and Broadkleist. So confident had Ethelred's reeve been that he had not emptied them of their treasure. We emptied the two manors of all that they contained and then burned them. A week later we left the southwest. Our departure was marred, for in the battle we had lost the first of the new warriors. Galmar Galmarsson had been a solid enough warrior and it was not his fault that he had died. The Norns had been spinning. A dying Saxon had hacked through the back of Galmer's leg, and before the bleeding could be staunched by warriors fighting for their lives, he had bled to death. Had we left before the battle, he would be alive. We had treasure, but treasure cannot buy young warriors. I was glad to see the back of the land and to head home to my wife, and, hopefully, a child. If I thought that it would be a swift journey home, then I was proved wrong. Carl stopped once again at White. We refilled our water barrels and took more of the harvest they had collected. But the real reason for our visit was for Carl to travel to Wintoncester, where he delivered a message to King Ethelred or those who represented him. It was a stark message. If the king wished to avoid a repetition of our raid, he would send tribute before the raiding season. 
we waited on the island for a week, but received no reply. Carl was not put out by the lack of response. He had not expected one. And the fact that the Saxons had not said they would not pay was hopeful. For us it mattered not, as with decks filled with both animals and thralls, we headed along the coast. We were going home, and with any luck, we would not have to raid for King Swain the next year. Chapter 6 Ayurhanna, 1002 It took longer to get home than we hoped. The winds did not cooperate and we were heavily laden. We would need to clean the weed from the hull and replace sheets. The months away had taken their toll on the Drekka. The men from Eyrhanna who had sailed with Lodvir and the rest of the Drekka came with us for our share of the treasure and thralls would take place at our home. For me, this was a mixed blessing. Whilst I would get home sooner, there would still be a delay while everything was shared out equitably. There had been drawn weapons on White when one captain felt he had been cheated. He had not. I hoped that we would not be needed here, but until the other ships sailed away, the three of us would be armed and protecting Swain's skulltaker. My share of the slaves and animals were a shepherd, three boys and a girl, a ram and four ewes, and a calf. The boys would be trained by Egbert to work in the fields, and the girl would serve Mary. I could have asked for more, but I did not need more. I had more coins, silver and gold now than I knew what to do with. I could not spend them, but I hoped that when she recovered from the birth that Mary would be able to travel to the market at Reaper. It took until late afternoon for the wealth to be distributed. Egbert had come to take away the slaves and animals. I did not ask about the birth, for that seemed unlucky. I would find out all when I entered my hall. The smiles I saw on the faces of Agneta and the other women who greeted their husbands told me that Mary and the child were well, and that sufficed. Had they frowned or wept, then I would have feared the worst. When all had left and we had bidden farewell to Lodvir, who was the last to leave, Jarl Swain Skulltaker spoke to the three of us. Know that I am more than happy with how you behaved on this raid. Other hearth where we were too concerned with their own glory. But you did all that was asked, and more. Do not think I did not notice how you helped the new warriors, and that we only lost one is down to the three of you. When time allows, I shall reward you, and I absolve you of any duties until we are summoned to war again. He waved a hand around the village. Although we are growing as a settlement, I am safe here. Enjoy your farms and your families. He pointed a finger at Hawk. And you, Alf, find a wife. He flushed, and we laughed. I headed back to my hall. The Jarl was right. There were new buildings and new families. Soon we would have a market, and then, perhaps, rival Riedbe. I took a deep breath as I entered my hall. I prepared to see my wife and child, and I confess I was more nervous than I would have been before a battle. I was empty-handed. Slaves had already fetched my shield, chest, helmet, and weapons. I wore just a simple tunic with oath sword at my side. I stepped across the threshold, and as my eyes became accustomed to the firelit hall, I saw my wife in the chair my mother had used. With curved wood at the bottom, my mother had rocked gently while she had spun. Now Mary rocked, and at her breast was my child. I walked over and, kneeling next to her, kissed her hand. You are well? It seemed an inadequate thing to say, but I knew not what else I should say. Mary looked almost saintly, and I swear that there was a glow about her, but that could have been the fire. Ay, husband and I see that you are whole. Come and greet your daughter, Gunhild. She was born three weeks ago, and she is healthy with a voice that demands food. You are in for sleepless nights. 
I looked at the babe whose head had turned from the nipple to look at me. She had blonde hair and blue eyes. She was beautiful. I had not enjoyed the company of babies and I knew not what to expect. Mary said, She hears more than she sees, but she is whole. It will take time for her to get used to you. She smiled. I knew none of this, but the women of your clan are kindness itself and they have told me what to expect. They did not lie to me about the birth and whilst it was painful, I am happy to try to make you a son next time. I laughed. Let us enjoy our babe first. You chose a good name and mother would be happy. I was named Mary after the Virgin and my mother. Gunhild has been christened, but a Danish name seemed appropriate. I am happy living here in Eärna. I stood and kissed the top of her head. And now I will go and bathe and take the stink of damp, sweat, salt water and blood from me. I thank you for not mentioning my pungent smell. She laughed. Do not worry, husband. Some of the smells our daughter makes will turn your stomach too. I am less fussy than I once was. That day began the most idyllic of times. My days were filled with work on my land and the training of the slaves, as well as spending time with my wife and daughter. The nights were joyful too as I was able to watch Gunhild as she slept. I also spent time as the days grew shorter and colder to melt down parts of the Saxon burney. It had not been the best of mail, but by melting it down in the weaponsmith's workshop, I managed to make a new boss for my shield and some metal pieces to add strength to it. I still had enough of the burney to use as replacement rings for my burney. The younger warriors now trained by themselves, although I knew that after the winter solstice there would be another eight new warriors to train. My life developed a pattern that was so predictable as to be comfortable. I did not have to worry about what to do. There were tasks ready for me each day. The ewes were all serviced by the ram, and that was a relief. We would soon have a flock. I did not think that we would be raiding the next year. Unless King Swain wished every Dane in his land to cross the water, then it would be someone else's turn. Galmer's death had made the young warriors realise that they had been lucky. They still trained for war, but they did not need war. There was a difference. As the winter solstice drew close, the Jarl held a feast in his mead hall. Mary had instructed the new girl and the other thralls to make me a tunic that represented my status. She had not understood the term Hearthweru when she had first been brought to the village, but now she saw it as a sort of minor nobility. I had to dress appropriately. She also had the girls plait my beard, moustache and hair. I found it tiresome, but it pleased Mary, and so I endured it. The new sealskin boots I had ordered, made from the seals hunted at the mouth of the Dunham, meant that I looked smarter than I could ever remember. Perhaps this was another side effect of marriage, for when we arrived at the Mead Hall, Swain One Eye was as well presented as I was. Hawk looked as though he'd dressed in the closest clothes he could find at the top of his chest. I was looking forward to the feast, as Swain would reveal his new song, the Song of Svolder, and I would be able to see those who, like Siggy, my first or brother, lived a little way out of Ayurhan. Although we three were seated close to Swain's skulltaker, I knew that men would rise to come to speak to us. Our mead feasts were not as formal as some I had heard of. As usual, the feast began somberly with a recounting of those who had died since last we had feasted. It was a shorter list than the ones which would be taking place in other mead halls. That done, we sat, and Swain Skulltaker spoke. He mentioned those who had performed particularly well on the raid. Those who had not distinguished themselves were not highlighted, for that was not our way. He then singled out the three of us, and I felt embarrassment as every warrior banged the pommel of his dagger or sayax on the table. Agneta would not be happy, and her thralls would have to spend the next days repairing the dents, scratches, and dints. I 
could not have asked for three better hearthweru, and the fact that they are all of my blood is particularly pleasing. He gave a smile at Griotard. I remember when they were appointed by me, there were some older warriors who questioned my choice. Everyone knew to whom he referred, and Griotard, to his credit, gave a mock bow and a shrugged apology. He had since recanted his opposition. They showed in white, Hampton Skir and Denshire, that they are the best of the clan. There were more cheers. To that end, I have had made for them by the goldsmith in Ribbe, three hair cumble for them to wear on their helmets. I have chosen the design as the bird that is the sign of our clan, with the dragon's sword, my foster's son's blade, oath sword. Since the blade came to the clan we have gone from strength to strength, and I wished these devices to commemorate the event. He passed one to each of us. They were beautiful. The sword was picked out in gold, as was the surround, and the sword lay on a sea of silver. It was very effective. The goldsmith had already drilled holes so that when we attached them they would not be damaged. I was touched beyond words, for the gift must have cost him much of his share from the raid. And now, on with the feast. I spent as much time admiring the Herkumble as drinking for the first part of the speech, until my cousin stood to sing his new song. The king did call, and his men there came, each one a warrior and a Dane. The mighty fleet left our home in the west to sail to Svalda with the best of the best. Swedes and Norse were gathered as one to fight King Olaf Trygvason. Mighty ships and brave warrior blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. The Norse abandoned their faithless king, aboard Long Serpent their swords did bring. The Norse made a bridge of all their ships, determined that King Swain they would eclipse. Brave Jarl Harald and all his crew felt the full force of a ship that was new. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. None could get close to the Norwegian king, to his perilous crown he did cling, until Skull-Taker and his hearth attacked the side of the ship that was new. Swooping hawk leapt through the sky to land like a warrior born to fly. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. With such great deeds the clan would sing, they cleared the Drekka next to their king. Facing Olaf were the Jarl and Sven, Eirhana and Oathsword joined again. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. The bodyguards of the King of Norway fought like wolves in a savage way. It mattered not, for the dragon sword won, stabbing and slaying everyone. The king chose the sea as his way of death, and Long Serpent was his funeral wreath. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. While it was not exactly the way it had happened, it was close enough to meet with the approval of the clan. The newer warriors saw that if they were as courageous, then in some future battle they might be named. It was the perfect start to the best feast I could remember. Swain, one eye and I carried Hawk to bed. I knew what he had to look forward to, for I had been there too. I fitted the Herkumble myself. I wanted it to be perfect. Mary could not understand the fuss. It is a small piece of metal. How will that help you in battle? It is what it represents, my love. Men will know how highly we are thought of, and that can give a warrior an edge in battle. She did not understand. But then my mother had never understood, and she had been Danish. By the time the days lengthened a little, a fortnight after the winter solstice, Mary consulted the women of the clan and gave me the news that she was with a child once more. The babe would be born at the start of Thvimanadur, and as we had no plans to raid, then I would be there. The Saxon girl we had brought from Denshire, Anna, had proved to be a natural when it came to looking after Gunhild, and Mary happily entrusted our daughter to her care. It meant that my wife could now attend to more of the duties of running the farm and lands. That was a relief to me as I had little interest in them. 
She and Egbert got on and enjoyed discussing the mating habits of animals and which fields to leave fallow. It was as though they were speaking a different language. Jarl Svein Skulltaker was often in either Ribbe or occasionally visiting with the king at Hedderbeer. It was through such meetings that we learned what was happening in the outside world. It was winter, and few ships traded. They were our usual means of discovering news, but in winter it was through the king, and we learned that the Saxons had paid twenty-four thousand pounds of gold to buy off King Forkbeard. That we only received a small amount for our trouble made men like Lodvir and Griotard angry, but the Jarl was philosophical about it. We made coin, and we benefited, but it cost us but a few warriors is something to thank the old father. With the gold safely in the king's hall at Heatherbeer, we will not be going to war. People across the water in the land they now called England assume that we are warlike people. We like war, but we do not need war, and the news that we would not have to wear our burnies nor sail across the seas to raid brought smiles to our faces. The young still trained for war, and Swain, Hawk, and I joined them, but it was a time for honing skills. We would need them, but not for some time. I visited Reba, too, with Mary, and we took Hawk with us for company. Leaving before dawn, we had two thralls and a wagon, for Mary was anxious to spend some of my hoard of coins. The thrall, Anna, was excited to be visiting somewhere so big. The village in Denshire we had raided had been just four houses, and when all the men were slain, we had taken the rest of the village. She sat on Hawk's second pony as we rode to Ribbe. We were well wrapped for the weather, but it was not as cold as it had been. It was a sure sign that spring was not far away. It did not do to speak of such things, it was considered bad luck. Hawk made Anna and Mary laugh as we rode along. He thought he had a good life. With no responsibilities, he hunted most days or just sat drinking with the other young warriors. I did not envy him, and even before Mary had come into my life, I had not enjoyed such a life. It suited Hawk. As soon as we reached the town, we went to the Jarl's Hall. Lodvir lived there, and it would have been rude not to speak to him. He accompanied us to the market, and it guaranteed that none would try to cheat us. That was an unlikely event. From my belt hung my dragon sword, and it ensured our safety, and that we would be treated well even by those merchants and traders who were new. Reba Market was a large one, and there were many who travelled to it. Our success had encouraged others to come here to live. There were some visitors from Norway. Since Svolde, that kingdom was jointly ruled by Denmark and Sweden. There was more trade between all three lands. There were warriors who still resented us, but not merchants and ordinary folk. There were merchants who visited the market to see if they could sell their own goods in what was seen as a peaceful land. The harbour was full of their ships, for there were empty berths. Our drekker were hauled on the beaches, having been cleaned and repaired and kept from their biggest enemy, the sea. While Mary examined every item presented, as though it contained a viper, I spoke with Lodvir and Hawk. Hawk had made an effort for the visit and looked every bit the dashing young warrior he was in battle. I saw some of the unmarried women of the town cast him admiring glances. He preened. Lodvir and I stood apart and spoke. Ribbe has become, since Svolde, a much busier place. I know that Ayahan has grown, Sven, but so has Ribbe. It is not just the Norse merchants who take advantage, but the Swedes too, now that they have parts of Norway, come here. Some merchants are building homes and warehouses here. He nodded to Hawk. Your father will be even richer soon, for there is a tax on new buildings and on ships using the port. It's not a large amount, but it builds up. I nodded. Hawk was beaming at a particularly pretty young woman who was at the same merchant as Mary and looking at the same items. Three Swedes were with her. It is the same at Eyrhon, Lodvir 
Since we returned from Wessex, I am amazed at the numbers who live close to the town now. I can see a problem in the future. Hawk had drifted off, and Lodvia asked, A problem? How so? Mary has told me that we are privileged, and I know what she means. We have land and a fine hall. What of the sons of Lars, Leif, and Drang? When they are ready to be men, where will they farm? Where will they build their halls? If these merchants come to build bigger halls and warehouses, where will be the land for ordinary warriors? If they leave Ayrhona and Ribba, then who will crew our drekka? Before Lodvia could answer, Hawk approached us with three Swedes and the pretty young woman. Here, sir, this is someone who seeks a meeting with you. I said I could introduce you. Lodvia and I smiled, for he had not done this for the merchants, but the young woman. The well-dressed Swede spoke. I am Axel Esterson and I am a successful merchant with land and ships. Since our kings have rid the seas of Olaf Tryggvason, I have begun to look for places I could use closer to the west, for that is where lies the best trade. England is a rich place, and there are more of your people living there than before. I see a way to make money. Here, see I would build a hall in your town. Lodvir nodded. I am here, see but this is the town of Alf the Swooping Hawk's father, Jarl Svein Skulltaker. Hawk had been using his eyes to dance with the maiden and had not been listening. Axel said, This is the warrior who brought the Norse line. I have heard of you, young man, and I am honoured. What? Oh, the leap! It was nothing, and we warriors do what we must do to win. It is in our blood. This was not like Hawk, who was not known for his false modesty. He was trying to impress the young woman, and from her fluttering eyes, he was succeeding. Axel turned back to Lodvia. Would it be possible to meet with you and discuss the matter? Lodvia had learned to be the counsellor when my foster father had made him Hersia, and he knew his responsibilities. Aye, you can come back now. Sven? Will you be offended if I leave you? I laughed. I have some hours yet, for my wife has yet to make her choices. We will see you again, Lodvia, for my wife will wish to return home this night. I looked at Hawk. And will you be returning with us, cousin? He looked at the young woman and then Lodvia. I think I will spend the night in Ribe. I have yet to decide upon what I will spend my coin. You do not mind, do you? Shaking my head, I said, No, it is good. Lodvir rolled his eyes, for like me, he knew the real reason. When Mary had made her purchases and the thralls were taken to the wagon, she asked, Where is Hawk? He went to Lodvir's hall with a merchant. Mary brightened. And that pretty young thing? I nodded. It is good, husband. Ayahon is too small for Hawk, and he needs a larger sea for his net. Come, we have yet to finish. I have heard of a woodcarver not far from here. We need a better table. It was not dark when we reached our hall, but it was very close to it. Gunhild was asleep, and poor Anna could barely keep open her eyes. I was glad that we did not have such a journey to do every week. Mary was happy, for she had spent wisely. The table would be delivered when the last details were finished, and that would take another month. It would give my wife the chance to have more building work done on the hall. She wished it changed to suit her and our growing family. Being the daughter of a priest, she had lived in a home that was theirs and they did not have to share. She wished my hall to be like that. She envisaged a great hall, as she termed it, but then there would be smaller rooms. When I pointed out that building walls would make them colder for it would hide them from the fire, she pointed out that we could have other fires and there was enough stone to make the fire safe. She also told me that she wanted wind holes putting in the walls. She believed that the movement of air was healthier. She pointed out that we now had wall hangings and they could be used to keep out the cold in winter. She was my wife and I went along with her. In the end, we found we just needed one more place for a fire, and the hall was still warm. 
Hawk did not return for a week, and when he did he came with Lodvir. They passed my land and Lodvir gestured for me to accompany them. Although Hawk's absence had been noted, it had not caused concern, for he was in Ribe, and there the son of the Jarl would be safe. And yet they examined him as he entered. And where have you been gadding, my son? He bowed and said, In Ribe, with Lodvir the Long. Swain Skulltaker was still one of the cleverest men I knew, and he had an ability to detect things which were yet unsaid. And yet you return with Lodvir and have asked Sven Saxonsort to join us. I think there is more here than a young man enjoying himself carousing. Sit. Lodvir, I would have you tell me what has happened. I could understand my foster father's concern. The last thing he needed was a wild son causing problems in his town. Ale was fetched, and I saw the frown on Agneta's face. Alf was her youngest and, I think, her favourite. As Sven will tell you, Hawk asked to stay in Reba when we met a Swedish merchant and his daughter, his youngest daughter. I saw Hawk suddenly stare at Lodvir as though willing him to be silent. Lodvir smiled. I will speak honestly, Hawk, as is my way, and tell the Jarl what I believe happened and why. Even I was becoming concerned. Axel Osterson is a very rich man, Yao. He has ships taking amber and timber from the east, and he trades for jet from the west. He has ships that sail to Normandy and trades with the Franks. He intends to build a hall in Ribe. All that is good, Lodvia, but I cannot see how it concerns my family. Nor did I, Jarl Svein, although as Sven will attest, Hawk and the young woman Frieda were attracted to each other. I was not concerned with that, but it became clear, as I spoke with the merchant, that he sought an alliance with Denmark. He encouraged Hawk and his daughter to spend time with one another. Agneta stiffened, and Lodvir held up a hand. All was done well, my lady. Axel brought his daughter to Reba in order to secure a husband, but not just any husband. He wished one who had influence. The Norns must have been spinning, for they put Hawk in their path. My cousin burst out. It is not like that. Frida and I love each other and wish to be married. Her father saw that we were made for each other. You make it sound as though it was planned, Lodvir. Peace, Hawk. Lodvir always speaks the truth. Sven, you were there when they met, and you too are honest. What say you? They looked at each other, and I saw that they were attracted to each other. She is a pretty little thing, foster father, and Hawk looked handsome. As for her father's intentions, all I can say is that he was keen to speak to both Hawk and Lodvir. Agneta said, Alf, come here and give me your hands. Agneta, like many of the women in the clan, was something of a vulva, and she stared into her son's eyes and held them. He did not waver, and she nodded. He believes that this is the woman for him, and as this is the first time he has shown any interest in marriage, Swain, then I think we encourage it. Hawk beamed, but his father's words wiped the smile from his face. Lodvir, where is the merchant now? In Reba. He's taken over an inn, and he's having a hall and warehouses built. The man is rich, Yao, and there are many men working on his home. If I am to be truthful, I am sorry, Hawk. I think he came to Reba not just seeking any husband for his daughter, but looking for the unmarried son of Jarl Swain Skulltaker. He had heard the story of the Battle of Svolda. And yet it did not seem put out. And perhaps the Norns have spun and trapped my son in their web. But that is. Weird, is it not? She nodded to her husband. Ludvia, return to Reba and invite Axel Osterson and his party to visit with us here. My wife and I will speak with him, and I will make a decision. That is not fair. I have made the choice. Hawk reverted to the reckless warrior he had once been. His father was patient, and Swain said, 
Alf the Swooping Hawk. When Sven Saxon Sword wished to marry, even though we knew his intended, he came to me to ask my permission. That was all he said, and I saw Hawk's shoulders slump in resignation. It would happen the way the Jarl intended. This would be a different sort of feast than the ones we normally enjoyed. It was rare for men and women to share the table in the mead hall. Normally it was reserved for warriors. This would be different, for as Agneta and Frida would be there, so the other wives would be invited. It marked the beginning of a change for us. Mary thought it wonderful, for she disliked the men-only mead hall and thought women exerted a moderating influence. She might have been right, and I for one did not mind. But older warriors like Griotard did. He could not understand it, and it took Swain one eye and me a whole afternoon to persuade him that it was not changing the old ways, but perhaps making a few changes. Agneta had chambers erected for her guests. The Jarl had the biggest hall in Ayahanna, and Agneta sought Mary's advice about making chambers. My wife and Agneta were now close, and that could not have been predicted when I took her as a thrall. The merchant came with his two bodyguards and his daughter, as well as his servants. Lodvir had told us that the merchant's wife lived in Norway. Frida was the youngest of six girls. The gods, it seemed, had not granted Axel sons, and his desire to make a good marriage made sense. He brought gifts for Swain and Agneta. For Agneta he had a necklace made of jet and amber. It was a beautiful gift, and even though we knew that the raw materials had not cost him much, the craftsmanship had. For Swain, he gave him a Sami bow inlaid with silver. It looked almost too beautiful to be used in war. The biggest surprise was Frida. She looked stunning, and her golden hair was coiled like serpents. I could now see that she was slightly older than I had thought, and was indeed of an age with Hawk. That they were smitten by each other was obvious and understandable. Hawk was a hero of Svolder, and what young woman could not be swayed by that thought? Frida looked like a princess. The looks I saw on the faces of Agneta and Mary showed that they approved, but the test would be Swain, who would not like to be used by this Swede. Frida was seated between Agneta and Frida, and Hawk between Axel and Swain. I was seated next to Swain one eye, and we were able to enjoy ourselves as we watched Hawk squirm as Axel and Swain spoke over him. Frida was also subjected to a volley of questions, politely asked, of course. One Eye laughed. Who would have thought my little brother would have succumbed to the first fluttering eyelashes he spied? I shook my head. He has been seeking a bride for some time. I saw him looking at the slaves we took on the last raid. He was seeking a beauty, and the Norns have spun him one. It was only after the Swede and his party left, having arranged a marriage for the summer solstice, that I realised how little the arrangement had to do with love. That there was love was clear, but that did not concern Axel. Unlike Mary and I, the two had been attracted from the moment they met. Mary and I learned to love. It was the Swede and our Jarl who made it more of a practical arrangement. Axel had money to spend, and he wanted the safety and security of a powerful warrior. The men of Ribbe and Ayahana were perfect. Jarl Swain also wanted something from the marriage, and Axel agreed to fund a Threatenessa. It was also agreed, to my great surprise, that Hawk would take over from Lodvir as Herseer in Ribbe at some time unspecified in the future. Lodvir was happy about the matter, for he had only taken on the role to please Swain. He agreed to stay on for half a year and act as advisor to my cousin. I knew it was a risk, but I knew how marriage had changed his brother and me. It might do the same for him. Swain One Eye was happy as he would now inherit Ayahana, and that pleased him. As we returned from the wedding on the shortest night of the year, my foster father spoke with me. Sven, 
I hope that you are not envious of your cousins. I frowned, for I did not understand the question. Envious? Your foster brothers will inherit power and titles, and I am unhappy that I can do nothing for you. I laughed. And I want nothing, Jarl. I'm happy with my hall, my family, and my life. I am pleased for Swain and Alf, and there is no envy harbouring in my heart. He looked relieved. Agnetta said that was how you would feel, but I needed to know. I love my sons, but we all know that in battle it is to we too that warriors look. When I cease to go to war, it is you who will lead the clan to war, as Lodvir predicted all those years ago before Ulthsword found you. I was both surprised and flattered, for I had not known that. My son was born on the first day of Thwimanador. He was a healthy child who was heavier than his sister had been, and was born with a shock of brown hair. The birthing had tired Mary out, but she was happy, for she had borne me a son. I had been in the hall during the birth and found the cries of pain hard to bear. I was glad that I had missed the first birth, for the second saw me shaking with fear at the thought of losing my wife. We named the boy Steyan after Mary's father. It pleased me, for there was not another Steyan in the village, and he would not be confused with another. There were Svens and Swains aplenty. Perhaps if we had another boy he might be a Bersi, but I was not certain I wished to put Mary through such pain again. With every warrior at home, we had the best harvest ever, and our animals produced more young than any could remember. Perhaps that was because we now had more animals to start with. My only concern was that all the decent land within three miles of Ayahana was now farmed, and it was not just the animals who had been fecund. Being at home for so long meant that the wife of every warrior was with child. Where would they farm? Those problems were for the future, for Swain now had a second son, and Frida was with child. The blood of Swain's skull-taker would flow through another generation. Chapter 7 Denmark, 1002 King Ethelred was not my king, but I knew that he was a bad one. He had paid us gold early in the year, but, and I know not why, on the last day of Gormanador, the day of the Christian saint St. Bryce, the king ordered every Dane living in his lands to be killed. Even now, many years later, I can find no sense in it. To make matters worse, two of the victims were King Swain's sister Gunhild and her husband Palik. The payment of gold Ethelred had made meant nothing to King Swain. He would have vengeance, and Jarl Swain and his Hearthweru were summoned to his court for a council of war. We had enjoyed a year of peace, but that would now end. We had thought the gold ensured peace. It did not. That there was anger amongst the Jarls was clear, but as I stood listening to the debate I sensed that King Swain Forkbeard was not as upset by the death of his sister as he made out. It struck me that he now had a pretext to go beyond just raiding, and bring large swathes of King Ethelred's kingdom under his control. I am not sure that he thought at the time that he would be king of that land, but having taken large parts of Norway, the ambition must have lurked in his head. The king's two sons, Harold, the younger, and Canute, the elder, were at the assembly, and I wondered what they thought of it all. The princelings were heirs to what might turn out to be an empire. That Harold was seen as the heir was down to the fact that Canute's mother had died and Harold's mother, Siegfried the Haughty, still lived. They showed in their faces and their builds that they had different mothers, and, as I later learned, their characters were different too. The assembled Hearthweru were spread around the hall. There was no hint of danger to our charges from weapons, but each Jarl, with the exception of Jarl Svein Harkonason, the Norseman, and our Jarl, had ensured that their Hearthweru wore shining mail and gleaming helmets. 
they were making a statement. We did not need such adornments, for our achievements spoke for us. I also had oath sword hanging from my belt, and I saw every warrior's eye drawn to it. Thralls brought refreshments to the room, but they were served by us, the hearthwedu. We tasted each jug before pouring it into horns. There would be no treachery in the hall, but the refreshments and the ale came from outside. We took no chances. There were many Norse who resented the defeat at Svolder, and while they might not have the courage to face us in battle, there were other means to achieve their ends. It was when King Swain spoke of Ethelred's new wife, Emma of Normandy, that we all paid close attention, for this was news. The sister of the Duke of Normandy suggested an alliance with warriors who would give us a harder fight than the Saxons. The Normans came from Viking stock and were renowned as fierce fighters. There were even a few who suggested we go to Rouen to fight them. Wise heads prevailed, but it was decided that we would attack England in the next campaigning season. The question was, where? I knew that his failure to take Exeter still rankled, and it was Carl Threefingers who suggested that we fall upon that burr. As part of his argument, he said that King Ethelred had given the land to his wife, and she had garrisoned it with some of her kinsmen. A new nunnery nearby also suggested a rich hall. When Carl said that he had a ready-made base on the Isle of Wight, it was decided. We would return to the scene of our great success. The difference would be that the fleet we would take and the warriors who crewed them would be able to defeat any army that the Saxons sent to defeat us. I thought that we would return to Ayohorna directly, but we did not. While other Jarls and their Hathweru left, we were summoned to a meeting with the king, Carl Threefingers, Jarl Sven Herkonason, and the two princelings. King Swain was smiling, and that always made me suspicious. He positively beamed and addressed Swain's skulltaker. Carl here has told me of the great deeds you did when you raided for me, and know that I am grateful. You helped to fill our war chest, and that will bear fruit when we raid. You too, Jarl Sven Harkonason, have been no less successful in putting down the rebellions fermented by those who lost at Svolder, and cannot face the consequences of their defeat. I would like the two of you to act as foster fathers to my two sons. Harald will go to Norway with you, Jarl Sven Harkonason, and Knut will join the Jarl of Ribbe and Eirhan. I would have them learn the art of war from the best that we have. Both are of an age where they can learn the art of war. They have been shown how to use a sword, but as the future leaders of Denmark and my lands in Norway, they need to learn the skills of leadership. I would, of course, train them, but I have other demands upon my time. What say you? There could, of course, be no refusal, and both Jarls nodded their agreement and their thanks for such an honour. My heart sank, for we now not only had our Jarl to protect, but also the heirs to the crown. Surprisingly, to me at least, they came alone and without either servants or guards of their own. Knut would live in the Jarl's hall and be brought up as I was, as a foster son. I wondered the arrangement and its purpose. Trying to see into Swain Forkbeard's mind was like trying to unravel the coils of a snake. Knut did have his own pony, and he could thankfully ride. He was no longer a child, but he did not have the frame of a youth of Eigerhorn at the same age. The farewells were perfunctory, and I saw none of the affection which Swain Skulltaker had for his own children, and indeed for me. This could only be a good thing for the princeling. We could not comment on the task, for the simple reason that while we were at the court we did not know who was listening, and it seemed both rude and offensive to Canute to talk about him as though he was not there. Instead, while my foster father wrestled with the new duties, Swain One-Eye and I spoke with the boy. 
Are ye hornies not as grand as Hedderby, Canute? I know. You are Swain One Eye, my cousin nodded. Did it hurt when you lost your eye? The wound hurt, and I did not know that I had lost the eye until later. It has taken me time to grow accustomed to fight once more, but my cousin Sven helps. He guards the Jarl's right side and I the left. The young Dane was a serious-looking youth, and he did not smile. It must have been hard for him to be thrust amongst strangers with barely a goodbye. And you are the warrior with the dragon sword, I nodded. You let me touch it when I was younger. That was kind, and I have never forgotten. Often warriors ignore me because I am young, but one day I will be older, and they will take notice. Hawk asked, Will you miss your brother? Not really for he hits me when others are not looking and his mother protects him when I try to fight back. I will have my revenge. I felt sympathy for him then as I remembered the blows I had received until I had stood up for myself. It made me determined to make his life as pleasant as possible. We were nearing Eyjohanna when Jarl Svein spoke for the first time since we had left the king. You will be treated the same as my sons were and as my grandchildren are. My grandson Swain is but a little younger than you. You may follow him for a while and do the same duties as he does. You will teach me the sword? To my surprise he was looking at me and not his foster father. I nodded. The three of us train the young warrior, so I. No, I would have you teach me. In Hedebeer, when men spoke of the Battle of Svolda and of the Battle of Dean, it was your name was mentioned more than any other. Carl Threefingers says that you are the best swordsman he has ever seen. My father said anyone who wielded a dragon sword would have an advantage. Carl did not agree, but he said nothing. His foster father said without turning his head, You will do as the other boys do. Sometimes it will be Hawk who trains you, and sometimes Swain One Eye. If you are lucky, then Sven Saxon's sword will teach you his skills. It will be many years until you need to use them. When we go to war next year, you will be with the boys who use slings and bows. Can you use either? No. Then before you use a sword, we will show you how to be useful in battle and harass the enemy. You will also fetch ale skins, and, if the battle appears to be going against us, you will take my banner to the rear. Canute was silent for the rest of the journey as he took in what would be a starkly different life than the one he had enjoyed in Hedebe. Two miles from Ayahona, Hawk was sent to warn Agnetha of our arrival. That he should have done so sooner showed that Swain's skulltaker's mind was elsewhere. He had much to think about. The result of Hawk's ride was that the servants and thralls were well presented when a possible king of Denmark dismounted. The Jarl handed his reins to me. Stable the pony, and then you are done. I fear you and my sons will now have less time with your families, and we have a princeling to watch. It was clear that he was not happy. Aye, Jarl. He seems a malleable boy. It may not prove as difficult as you imagine. He gave a wry laugh. I fear it will prove much harder than I imagine. There are problems I have not even considered. Taking a boy to war is hazardous enough, as you well know, but taking one of the king's sons has no good side to it. The best we can hope is that he returns from the X hole. Tomorrow we will meet to work out a routine for him. When I reached my home, Mary had heard the noise of our arrival. I told her of our new charge and, almost as an afterthought, about the attack planned for the next year. She looked wistfully at our sleeping son. At least we have enjoyed a year without war. And I wonder at King Ethelred. Why does he poke the wolf? I know not, but you are right it was a foolish act, and it will bring more tears to the hearths of his warriors. Winter was not as bad in Denmark as it was further north, but as we settled down to train Canute and the other warriors for war and to prepare ourselves for battle, it was hard to face the morning with a wicked wind coming from the east, often bringing sleet and snow showers. 
it encouraged us to be active. Jarl Svein gave each of us one day a week when we would not be needed, and that was more than I hoped for. Knut was the youngest warrior we trained by some margin. Boys his age would normally have been used as ship's boys, but we could not do that with Knut. He was the king's son, and it would be too late for him to learn the skills. He was, in any case, slightly bigger than most who scurried up the lines and ropes. I gave him lessons with the bow and hawk with the sling. When we went to war, then the boys would often face the greatest risks and have to stand before our battle line to weaken the enemy. If that was Knut's fate, then he risked a short life. Faramir, Gandalfir, Falmer, Snorri and the other warriors we had trained still attended when they could, and they joined the new warriors who had to endure all that they had. We knew that this time we would be attacking Exeter, and so we practised making a moving wall of shields that would protect warriors who could hack at a palisade with an axe. The younger warriors were expendable, and it was they would have this duty. The hearthweru would be likely to be the ones who hacked and chopped at wooden walls. I was not looking forward to taking the town, but I knew that it would be the richest prize we had ever taken. Why else would Ethelred give it to his new bride? Swain One-Eye saw Canute not only when we trained the new warriors, but also each night. His own son was used to show Canute his duties. It was a test of him as a future leader. He could have done as his own brother had done and made the life of Svein Svensson a misery, but he did not. He was aware that the boy was in awe of him and treated him kindlier than one might have expected from the son of King Forkbeard. Lodvir spent much time visiting too, but that was nothing to do with Canute and all to do with the preparations. We had ten ships we would be taking, including the new threat Anessa, Axel's Gift. I was not sure it was an appropriate name for a drecker, but all the correct ceremonies and rituals had been in order, and it was his money. Lodvir would sail it, and Griotard would be promoted from sailing master to the captain of Hyrokin. I feared for my old friend, for I was not sure that he would stay out of the fighting. When we trained the young warriors, I found that the old man had slowed, and all but the most inexperienced could best him. It had been more than a year since we had sailed, and so every drecker was hauled from the water, and we cleaned their hulls. This was a chastening experience for Canute, but as every male, including the Jarl, was so occupied, he had little choice. This time we not only rid ourselves of the weed, but applied a concoction that appeared to kill the worm which might otherwise eat out the keel. Finally, the wood was protected with pine tar. Although the most necessary of tasks, it was the one we all hated. Whatever clothes we used would be ruined, and the tar would still be found in our fingers a week after the work was done. It was as we did it that Thorsten gave the Jarl the bad news that Sea Serpent would not have many more voyages left in her, for battle and age had both taken their toll. On the day I had to myself, I found that Gunhild was becoming more of a person and less of a mewling babe. She would recognise me and smile. The joy that brought was indescribable, and I found myself surprised that I liked it so much. If she did not smile and reach for me, I felt as though a Saxon had stabbed me with his sayax. I know it was foolish, but she was my firstborn. I would walk with her, holding her two arms until I thought my back would break. She would giggle and laugh when we did so. I looked forward to the time that Steyan would be old enough to do the same. I was gentle with Gunhild, but I knew that I would be rougher with my son. He would grow up in the harder world of boys. Gunhild would be protected, and that was as it should be. As we prepared to set sail, I sharpened my weapons. This time I would take the good sword I had captured before I had married Mary. I realised that I had the skills to use two swords. My long dagger, Norse gutter, had been a revelation to me, and in some circumstances of more use than a shield. I had made a second scabbard, and Mary had woven a dragon design for the outside. I wore that one over my back. I packed my chest a week before we sailed so that I knew I had all that I needed. 
This time it would be hard for Hawke to leave, for he had a wife, and that wife was with child. He had entered the world of his brother and me. It showed, for he was more serious, and, when we trained the new warriors, he laughed less and chastised more. Frida would stay with Agneta, and she would be well looked after. Her father was off trading. He did not know exactly where we would be raiding, but he knew that we would raid, and he could profit from it. He was not a warrior, and he fought his wars with coins and nar. When we returned, then Hawk would take over as Heasir of Ribe. We had a farewell feast in the Mead Hall. It was all the warriors we would be taking. This time our ship would be fully crewed, as would Axel's gift and Hyrokin. A Yerhonna would have two hundred warriors when we fought the men of Exeter. Knut did not sit and eat at the feast, but joined the other ship's boys who waited on us. It was a good way to be. That none of us abused our position showed what a wise choice King Forkbeard had made. Knut brought another large piece of cooked pig, and the others were busily chopping hunks off it. As he stood to wait for the platter to be emptied, he chatted with me. I was happy for him to call me Sven rather than my full name, and he and I often chatted easily. The oath sword connection made that easier. Sven, what do we eat on board a Drekka? I have sailed on one, but never for long. We cannot cook, can we? I smiled. Not unless you wish a burnt boat. Let me see, we will have bread for the first few days. It will become staler, but salty seawater makes it softer. We have pickled fish and dried meat, and, of course, you and the other boys will have lines trailing astern, and you will catch us fresh fish, which we eat raw. Believe me, that is the best of food. We will sail down the coast of Northumbria and Mercia. We can scavenge for shellfish. You will get used to the food, and then when we land, we eat whatever we can take. He took away the platter and returned with a dozen small fowl called pullets. I was fond of them, and I took two. As he waited for the platter, he asked, And where will I sleep? We had discussed this, and the Jarl wanted the princeling protected. The three of us will use our chests and capes to make a den, and you will sleep there with us. I do know it will not be as bad as it could be. Those who sleep close to Greatard the Grim will have to endure his snores and, even worse, his foul farts. It made the boy laugh, as I knew it would. I believe I had put his mind at rest. It was Agneta who had his chest made up. It was small enough to fit between Hawks and the gunwale. He would not be wearing mail and had no helmet so it could be smaller. He would not need to sit on it, and Agneta ensured that it had a sealskin cover to keep it dry. She was a caring woman. At the feast there were no songs, and few drank to unconsciousness. It was just an opportunity in the peace and calm of the Mead Hall for men to talk of things other than war. Their land and animals, their families, their hopes for the future. It was a time of reflection, and once we left we would all adopt our war face the next time we met. Then would be the chance for bold songs and for a warlike demeanour. When we faced the Saxons, and possibly the Normans, then they would feel our full wrath. For us, it was nothing to do with avenging the dead of St. Brice's Day Massacre. We did not know those people. We were going to fight an enemy we despised, and to take all from him so that we would be richer and they would be poorer. None of us might like King Swain Forkbeard, but at least he was a proper king, one who led. When we assaulted Exeter, he would be there with us. I doubted that Ethelred would leave his fortress city of Londonwick. That night, Mary lay in my arms. Steanna had been satiated with the breast and slept. Anna lay in Gunhild's chamber, and my wife and I could whisper and cuddle. As much as I do not like that you go to make war, and to make war on my people, I cannot help but think that this weak king— what was it one of your jarls called him? A driveller. He has brought this upon himself. He has a choice with an enemy like you. He either fights or submits. 
it seems to me that he has done neither, but, husband, and I know you will do as I implore, be not cruel. Do not kill for the sake of killing. Kill if you must, but kill warriors. I kissed her. And you know that is my way, but do not try to make a Christian of me. Our children can be brought up so, but when Steanna is old enough, he will stand in the shield wall and he will defend himself. To do anything else would mean his death. She kissed me back and there was a silence, until Mary's words cut like a knife. He could be a priest. And if that was truly his choice, then I would accept it. I would not be happy, for I believe that our children will have the strength of us both within them, and a priest would not be world enough for either of them. You enjoy the life of a lady, do you not? I, of course. And your parents enjoyed such a life too? Her silence was eloquent, and she did not answer. Soon her breathing showed me that she was asleep. It was rare that I had the last word and I tried to remember how I had managed it. Chapter 8 Canute was not to be given sea duties. Firstly, it was too risky, and secondly, he did not have the skills the other boys did. He had not had the experience of scampering up ropes and lines like a squirrel. He had not balanced the top of the yard to peer out to sea with a deck pitching back and forth. He had not been brought up to race along a strewn deck with heaving oars and a storm sent by Njother. He would wait by the steering board and act as a messenger for Thorsten the Lucky. He would fetch our horns of sea ale, and if a storm blew, cover us with our capes. In short, he would become a servant. But when he ruled it would help, for he would know what the lowliest of his subjects did when they went to war. That he was slightly older and a little bigger than the other boys would also be a spur for him to avoid making a mistake. As usual, the first part of the voyage was the easiest. We sailed to Ribe to meet with the other Drekker. There would be too many ships for the port when the king came, and so we would await his arrival aboard our Drekker and sail out to meet him when his fleet arrived. We had been told that there would be one hundred or more ships, and that meant five thousand warriors. Our king was taking the vengeance trail, and he was taking no chances. Even Jarl Sven Hakonason and twenty Norse ships would be joining us. Knut and his brother would be in the same war, but in different parts. Their experiences would be different and would make them different men. The fleet arrived three days later, and they appeared as dark dots on the horizon, and then, as the sails grew larger, we saw the size of the fleet. It was formidable. Although it was not as large as the one from Svolda, it would be harder to keep together, for we had more open sea with which to contend, and we would not be able to simply wait for an enemy to appear. As soon as the dots were seen, we readied for sea and rode out in good order to wait a mile or two off the coast. We had not received orders about our position, but Swain Skulltaker had told his captains that we would adopt a three drekkar wide formation with ours at the head. Pots had been made to contain oil we could burn at night so that we did not become separated. The responsibility of keeping the pot filled on our ship was given to Canute. That first row to the meeting point was our easiest one, and we just sculled to exercise muscles that had not had to do this for some time. Even so, when we hove to and awaited the fleet, I turned and saw some of the new men at the prow rubbing their hands. I saw Faramir speaking with them. The advice I had given would be passed on. The usefulness of Adda must have been mentioned to King Swain, for there was one attached to the fleet, and Blue Tongue headed towards us. King Swain asks that your ships take position to the larboard of the ships of Heatherby. I will do so. Thorsten nodded his satisfaction. They were the ships Carl had led on the last raid, and we knew their captains and the quality of their seamanship. The problem would lie with the unknown ships which would follow us. A poor lookout could result in a collision. It took an hour or more for the ships to be positioned to the king's satisfaction, and then, with a breeze from the northeast, we headed due west to the estuary of the Seals. 
I wondered, as our backs heaved and we rode with purpose, if the king intended to emulate entirely Carl Threefinger's raid. If he did, then our predictability might be our undoing. We did not have to row for long, and as the sun began to set ahead of us, then oars were stacked on the mastfish and the sails were reefed a little. Our lights were replicated on other ships, and our tiny glowing dots continued to sail through the night. It was not just the ship's boys who stood watch. A quarter of the crew also kept a sharp lookout, for there were ships to our steerboard and behind. We knew there would be no land until we saw Northumbria, but ships could be wrecked, and an upturned hull could seriously damage a ship. The second day found a stronger wind which helped our progress. But the swells and troughs made a rougher passage, and some of the new sailors found it hard to retain the food they had consumed. Part of it was the change of diet. Canute looked a little green, but he managed to hold on to the food he had devoured, although I noticed that it was a whole day before he ate again. The wind continued during the night, and Jarl Swain had us as the night watch. Canute was happy to join the watch, but we sent him to our fur-lined nest. He had eaten little, and there was little that he could do. We needed experienced eyes. The next morning one of the new ships which had been behind us had disappeared. We did not even know her name, but that she had a red and blue dragon prow. Speculation was idle, for anything could have happened to her. We knew that she had not collided with our ships, for none had damage, but another sort of collision or a weakness which had been aggravated by the weather could have caused her to disappear. It was one ship, and the king did not waste one moment in searching for her. We pushed on. Once again we used the Dunham to make minor repairs and to hunt seals. Those who had been there the first time knew where to look, and we ate cooked seal that night. Carl Threefingers had helped the king with his plans, and we did not land at the Isle of Sheep. In fact, once we neared the Thames, we headed out to the sea so that we would not be seen from the Kent coast. This time we landed on the south coast, and three smaller drekker were sent north to retake the fishing village we had occupied. If the fisherfolk remained, then they would not fight. They had learned their lesson. We made a camp, and King Swain called his council of war. It was almost a thing, for there were more than a hundred captains, Herseer and Jarls, who listened to the king and his lieutenant as they explained their plan. Knut was with us, and I saw his brother Harold. The two did not even exchange a look, and standing with their respective foster fathers, did not have to speak. It was Karl who spoke, and that was reassuring. He had made mistakes, but not many of them, and we were confident that if he spoke, then the plan had his approval. We return to the X, but this time we shall take Exeter. My oathsworn and I have warriors to avenge. The king looked indifferent, but I knew that the men they had lost in their failed attack rankled with Carl and his men. We shall sail up the X and camp on both sides of the river. Jarl Swain Skulltaker and his men will seal off the town from the northeast. They will raid as far as the burnt out hall of Pinho before joining the rest of the war band to surround the Burr. Every crew will make their own ladders to assault. We'll spend a day identifying the key parts of their defences, and then, when we sound the war horn five times, we attack. That was the plan of attack, but there were other elements that concerned the campaign. Once we have taken the town, and take it we will, we we'll ravage the countryside until they send an army to meet us. We we'll cannot count on a leader as poor as Kula was, but whomsoever they send, we will defeat them. We we'll then march east. The fleet will follow, and each captain will need to leave a crew so that our ships can return to our camp at White. It was then I saw the cleverness of the plan. It had just enough differences from the original raid as to throw off any Saxon plans they might make. When we returned to our drekker, Lodvir and the Jarl joined with Griotard to choose which crews would stay aboard. In the end it was a mixture of experienced and older warriors who might find the march across Wessex harder, and the younger warriors who were untried. 
As we would all be involved in the assault on Exeter, then every warrior would have the opportunity to be blooded and to take treasure. We would march east with a pared-down warband. Canute was a clever youth, and as we settled down to eat, he asked us questions that showed he had a military mind already. We will lose men when we attack the walls and ditches of this burr. He had never seen one, but we had told him what they would be like. I nodded. It is inevitable, for it will be heavily defended, and even a farmer or a merchant who hurls a rock or throws a spear has the ability to cause a wound or death. Men who know they are going to be slaughtered fight hard, and there will be their families inside the burr. It is why your father sends us to cut the burr off from the northeast. When our ships are seen, then many will try to make the walls. This way we ensure that there are as few men inside the stronghold as possible. He nodded. And then we put some men in our ships and they sail east. We all nodded and ate the food which had just been ladled in our wooden bowls. Then the further east we go, the more chance we have of facing an army which is greater in number than ours. I was impressed with the way he had worked out the problems we would face. Aye, Canute, but we are usually outnumbered in any case when we face the Saxons. Know this, they fight in a different way to us. In the times of King Alfred, then every man in the land would be raised to fight us. That is how they defeated King Guthrum. I unconsciously touched the sword the great king had used. Now they do not use every man, and each hundred has to supply a certain number. That is their weakness, for the ones who fight know that there are others who are not. They have fewer mailed men than we do, and so if the battle goes against them, then the weaker ones will break. That is what happened at the Battle of Dean. Of course, it does not guarantee victory, but we win more than we lose. Hawk wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. And you, young Canute, will be at the battles we fight. You will hurl your stones at the enemy and hope to kill or hurt at least two. That way the odds are lessened the closer they come to us. It was as though he suddenly realised the danger he would be in. And they will be trying to kill me. One eye laughed. For sure. And that is why Carl Threefingers ensured that you had a leather jerkin and a cap. You may still be hurt, but they lessen the chance of death. And, I advised, you will need quick feet so that when the order comes to return, you race back and hurl yourself beneath our shields and crawl to safety. That does not sound dignified. We all laughed, and I shook my head. Forget dignity and think of life. When you emerge unscathed behind our rear lines, then you will be alive, and there is nothing more dignified than life. Our previous raid had prepared us well, and we negotiated the mouth of the X just after dawn. It was as we neared the head of the river that we heard the tolling of bells. Carl's plan made it easier for us as we kept to the steerboard side of the river and had no other ships to navigate. As soon as we reached the sand, the hearthweru leapt to shore and waited while the ship was secured to the shore. We left our spears aboard. It was unlikely that we would have to face a shield wall and our swords would be better weapons. Some of the ship's boys would remain aboard with Thorsten, but half, including Knut, would be coming with us. Each crew would operate alone and our end point would be the ruined hall and the village of Pinho. Each crew had a horn, and if there was a serious threat, then a blast would summon help. The tolling bells told us that we did not have long if we were to do as Carl Three Fingers wished. They knew we were here. We disembarked quicker than I had ever known, and our crew, all sixty-six of us, raced off through the fields. We had four miles to run, for Pinho was north and east of Exeter. Our speed was rewarded when we saw hundreds of Saxons running towards us and heading for the burr. We were two miles from our ships, and the nearest crew to us was that of Lodvir, two hundred paces from us. The people were heading for the Herapath, the road which had been built by King Alfred to connect the burrs. As we drew swords to run at the Saxon men who were trying to make a barrier between us and their women, the Jarl shouted, Sven, watch the boy. Even as I acknowledged the order, I saw that Canute had run ahead with the other slingers and was whirling his sling above his head. I cursed his speed, for he was forty paces from me. The four slingers struck Saxons, and I heard a whoop from Canute as his stone pinged off the helmet of a Saxon who dropped to his knee. 
Canute looked around for another target, and I saw to my horror that the Saxon had risen and was knocking an arrow. The range was less than forty paces, and he could not miss. Canute! My words were in vain, for there was so much noise, screams and the sound of feet pounding on the ground, that he did not hear. I ran as though my life depended upon it, and I watched the Saxon begin to draw back the bow as Canute hurled another stone at another Saxon. I saw the bowstring touch the Saxon's ear when I was just ten paces from the boy, and I did the only thing I could. I ran between the arrow and Canute, turning my back as I did so. Canute looked up in shock as I appeared, and then the arrow struck. It was as though someone had smacked me hard upon the back, but my cloak, shield, and mail protected me. Stay behind me. When I turn, I want you there. He nodded, and drawing my second sword, ran towards the Saxon who had foolishly decided to end my life with a second arrow. He was too slow, and I was twenty paces from him when he knocked the arrow. His eyes were on the knock and not on me. As he looked up, he saw his death as oath sword swept across his unprotected neck and half severed his head. I looked for another threat and saw that there was none close by. I turned and said, Take the Saxon's bow, arrows, and sayax. They are yours. He nodded as he obeyed. You have an arrow in your back. Pull it out and keep it, Canute, for it will be a reminder of how close you came to death. Had the arrow hit you, then you would be dead, and I would have to explain to your father why I failed to protect his son. It was a chastening experience for the youth who had been caught up in the moment. He now dogged my steps and I had to be careful, as we carved our way through the Saxon men, not to catch him with my sword when I made a wide swing. There were more warriors and men than I had expected, and as the women and children realised the futility of getting through an increasingly large warband and headed north away from Exeter, Jarl Swain led us to Pinho. Another of our crews was further northwest, and they would deal with the Saxons. We saw the reason for the large number of men. They were rebuilding Pinho. There was a hall and a church, as well as some houses in the process of being built. The Saxon camp had animals tethered there, and there were tools scattered around. Lodvir, take the animals back to the ships. The rest of you take what is of value and then burn everything. The buildings, the camp, and the tools. Let us show the Saxons that we have returned. By the time we had finished, a pall of black smoke rose in the sky. There was no hurry as we headed to Exeter, which lay just a couple of miles away. Already it was surrounded by a ring of campfires. The fires were there to help our warriors identify where they could camp, and they were also a threatening message to the Saxons. They were going nowhere. There would be no attempt to ask them to surrender. King Swain wanted a victory, for he was in command. Svolder had shown him that he had to lead. Then he had been tardy and had missed out on the glory enjoyed by Jarl Sven Harkonnason and Swain Skulltaker. Our king would have songs sung about him. We were directed to our camp by one of Karl Threefinger's oathsworn. You have this three hundred pace section of the wall. Almost absent-mindedly Swain nodded and then took off his helmet to assess the walls. Swain one eye shouted, Make a camp here! Canute, find us ale. Yes, Swain one eye. Canute was still subdued after his brush with death. I knew that when he slept he would find it hard, for he would imagine what would have happened had I not managed to reach him. The three of us went to stand with the Jarl, and we took off our helmets. Hawk laughed when he saw the hole in my cloak. When I explained how I had acquired it, he said, Sven Saxon sword. Perhaps we should name you Sven Princeling Shield. One name is enough for me. I cannot blame the boy, for he hit a warrior with his first throw, but I could do without the responsibility. Without turning, the Jarl said, And yet, my son is right in one way, Sven. You have been chosen as the boy's protector. For the rest of this raid, I will make do with my sons for protection. 
I did not like it, but I always obeyed orders. The defences were indeed formidable. There were stakes before the ditch, and while I could not see the bottom of it, I knew there would be stakes there to catch us as we crossed it. The part nearest to us would be deep, what men called an ankle-breaker, and the slope on the other side would be equally dangerous. The wooden walls were built atop what looked like Roman foundations, and there was a fighting platform. Towers were at each corner, and over the gatehouse, which also looked Roman. To reinforce the gate, the bridge over the ditch had been drawn up to protect the wooden gate. The walls were lined with men. We knew that they would not all be warriors, but that did not matter. They would have stones, arrows, boiling water and spears to hurl at us as we crossed the killing field before the walls. We cannot risk the ones without mail. We will have to use those who have burnies. Swain One Eye kept such numbers in his head. We have eighty of those. Then make sure that the others all have a bow. They cannot assault the walls, but their arrows can make life hard for those on the walls. We have the night to prepare, for I know that King Swain will order the attack as soon as he can. Hawk said, We found many arrows at Pinno. I will have those distributed, and I will set the boys to collect in river stones. It will keep them occupied. Marriage had made Hawk 